City. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we amend the following changes to our agenda. Uh, under unfinished business, item B, that we will table that to before the second hearing of the public. Moving on to new business, items B, C, and D, we will move before unfinished business. Items E, F, and G under new business will be stricken from the record and be put onto next month's agenda as new business. I'd like to second that. Motion and support. Any other comments? Proposed changes? Seeing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. DeHunt? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Mr. Broll? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Ms. Zulinski, yes. Chairman Lubeck? Yes. <clears throat> At this time, we're going to have our first hearing of the public. Everyone will have the opportunity, if they so desire, to speak for three minutes. We ask that if you do want to speak, approach the podium. Please clearly print your name on the notepad that is provided so we can have that for the record. And this evening, uh, Councilman DeMonico has offered to serve as the person timing, so he's the gentleman closest to the podium there, if you don't know who he is. And he'll give you a 30-second warning. And also, at the first hearing of the public, at this point in time, you can speak on any item that pertains to the Planning Commission. However, I sense many of you are here to discuss the issue of container houses, for lack of a better way of describing that. If you would please hold your comments on that until the public hearing, that would be the most appropriate place and time to make those comments. Having said that, is there anyone that wishes to be heard? Anyone wishing to be heard at the first hearing of the public? Yes, sir. Gary Myron, East Point resident. Uh, one is uh, the agenda for the Planning Commission is hasn't been on the internet since October, and I was just wondering why. Along with. Um, I know this is not for now, but I'm going to say just this has been passed out. Container houses, it tells you about it. There's two dates. Today's date for today's meeting is tomorrow's date, and along with the city council on the third, and on this sheet, it says the fourth. So somebody was passing this out and giving misinformation on the dates of the meetings. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to be heard at this time? Hi, my name is Laura Fries. I'm here for, I believe, new business of fence. Um, it's supposed to be a masonry fence. I think that they're looking to put a privacy fence up. We have two masonry fences in between a chain link fence, which is where a masonry fence is supposed to go when a new business owner comes in. I think they wanna just put up a privacy fence. I don't see the point of that. Okay, uh, we will be discussing that. I'm assuming that's one of the new business items. It's not a new business. It's a new business owner. No, on our agenda. It's okay. one of the new business items on our agenda. Okay. Uh, if you would, uh, we're going to give the neighbors that are affected by this the opportunity to speak when right. we do that review, and we'll give you an opportunity to speak then. Okay. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Uh, 
I'm not sure how things work, but uh, there's a property that's going to be uh, currently at the corner of Kelly and... Um, okay, if, if you would state your name. Oh, Brenda Trotter. Okay. Uh, uh, my sister and I are here, and one other neighbor, we expressed a little concern because we're close to that corner. Right now there's a famous footlocker there, and there's a lot of traffic on occasions coming to that store, and we're just concerned about what uh, kind of traffic this new retail establishment is going to bring. Will there be a lot of traffic coming down our street? Because that's what happens with the Foot Locker. Okay, that's uh, new business item D. Yes. All right. Uh, we'll give you another opportunity to speak when we are discussing that matter. Anyone else wishing to be heard at this time? Yes, sir. Yes, you have to use that. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, and it's necessary to speak into the microphone. Hi, my name is Rick Brancato, and this has something to do with the container, but I know it's being shelved. But I want to know, um, a few years back, the requirements in East Point was 880 square feet in order to sell a house some of them were 800 square feet my son tried to buy one and they said you have to put an addition on to 880 the containers two of them together will not make up 700 feet i'm just wondering is that is that going to be brought up when you're tabling the container we are not tabling it we are just moving the item around on where we are going to handle the business as opposed to where it is <coughs> showing up on the agenda. Is there going to be any kind of changes in square footage? That's what we're here to discuss tonight. No decisions have been made. Okay, okay. Do you want me to write my name now? Yes, please. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, I will close the first hearing of the public and we will go on to the approval of minutes for the January 2nd, 2020 meeting. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the January 2nd, 2020 minutes. Support. We have a motion by uh, Mr. Broll, support by Mr. DeHunt to approve the minutes. Questions, comments, additions, deletions, corrections? Seeing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Brohl? Yes. Mr. DeHunt? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman Lubach? Yes. That brings us to new business item B. Ms. Van Heron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mark Fuga is seeking approval for a masonry wall. He's requesting alternate screening for property located at 21059 Kelly, property ID 02-14-29-106-064, Obenauer Barber Lang Co. Ridgemont Park, lot number 85. Is a petitioner or a representative here? Yes, sir. Okay, if you would. Ms. Ha, have you reviewed this? No, we do not review the masonry wall request. Okay. Um, uh, th that wall is for another property I'm petitioning, the next one, C. Uh, concerning uh, petition B, I, I own one of the buildings where if I were to put the wall up, the property across the alley, he's got a line of trees that's beautiful from the street all the way through where I would actually have to cut 20 foot of his trees out to put a wall there. 
Um, if the city's requiring it, I would say let me put the nice looking white uh, uh, vinyl fence up. But um, I, I would prefer to just wait until the neighbor property sell where then we could all do it and do a proper wall through the whole thing. Um, so I, I guess what I'm asking is for a pass on it to wait until. But if not, if I've got to do it, I would prefer to put the vinyl fence up just so it'll look a little better for the guy. And okay. I'm going to be ruining his lawn because I'm taking 20 foot of trees out of his 60 foot tree line, you know. All right. I'm assuming that property is 17672 one, Springer. I, I believe it is, yes. 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 Is, the, uh, is there anybody here from uh, 17672 Springer that would like to speak on this matter? You know, I, I went to the house. The, the guy is uncomfortable speaking to people, and I, I, I think he's pretty open. To, he'd prefer it not to be me cutting his trees down, but... Um, He's just uh, it's most effective if we hear that from the the yeah, person. I understand that, but that's yeah, I, there. I, I, I asked him to come, but he's uncomfortable with that. Okay, Miss Van Heron has given us two suggested uh, motions with this. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if you're if you'd like, I'd be happy to read my memo just with a brief explanation of this. Sure, if you would like to read that into the record, that would be appreciated. Yeah, yeah happy to. This is regarding two one zero five nine Kelly. The property referenced above requires a masonry wall as they are changing the occupant of the property and, in accordance with Section 50-231 of the ordinance, are required to erect a wall between the commercial and residential property. The property owner is requesting the use of alternate material in lieu of a masonry wall. There is currently no dividing, no wall dividing residential from commercial on the entire block between Springer and Eagle. The residential property has a line of trees and shrubs and a chain link fence. The tree line along the side of the house to the street is thick and provides screening between commercial and residential. The length of the screen wall is 20 feet and is not at the beginning or at the end of the area that should be screened. Because it would be awkward to install only 20 feet of a wall adjacent to this residential property, I recommend the Planning Commission either one, allow the existing tree line to remain in lieu of the wall or fence, or two, postpone the requirement until the adjacent commercial neighbor changes ownership or occupancy necessitating the screen wall. And then I did provide a couple of proposed motions. I, I would like to have that man keep his trees. Uh, I think we don't have enough trees right now. We've had numerous fires out west and in the northwest. South America is cutting trees down at a rapid rate. And now uh, Australia has a forest fire over there that is probably going to lose, they're probably going to lose better than 50% of all the trees they have. Hold on. We need to keep the trees. You want to keep trees, and you hate trees. It's already there. <laughs> this, this is not Are the rocket science. flying through the air? Leave the trees alone. <clears throat> the birds told me we'd like to keep the trees. <laughs> if you don't know, Commissioner Jakubiak hates trees. <laughs> Depends where they're at. <laughs> I'm in complete agreement. Any other commissioners have any thoughts or questions on the matter? What is um, I'm in agreement. Okay, what is this, <coughs> what is this property zoned? The business property zoned? B1. B1, and that's a public alley behind. That's correct. Right. What happens if the neighbor, what happens if we approve keeping the trees and the neighbor owns the trees and makes the decision to remove the trees? <coughs> Is there any requirement that what happens? What's the outcome? There's nothing, right? Right. It probably won't happen. They're beautiful yeah. trees. Yeah. But it's, um, it's yeah. At some point in history, they could certainly come down. Um, right. 
in, in the motion, if you allow the trees to remain um, between the property, and then I guess, yeah, I, I, I don't know. If those trees were to be cut down, we would lose the uh, screening that is required in the ordinance. Therefore, that would trigger the business owner to have to come back and provide some type of screening there, wouldn't it? I think that's reasonable. I, I do think that what you're suggesting is, is, is reasonable. Okay, let's say the building next door or the 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 company the building next door that's attached changes ownership tomorrow mm -hmm. i guess we if we went one way with the trees with one building we would probably do it with all the adjacent buildings i guess that's the outcome. yeah and you, and you may decide you know at different locations on that block to require a masonry wall begin at a certain point and and end at a certain point but at least in this area where there's a the tree line and they've been there for you know and well established sure. that you can certainly allow them to remain yeah I mean I, I want the trees to remain too the only issue is I just want the flexibility that if something were to change that we're not locked into having no 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 um, some type of berm or, or tree there fence make that part of I the motion make then. sure that we have something included yeah in the motion. I'd, I'd include that with a motion so you could say something so to litter the, Go ahead. so you could say something to the effect contingent upon the continuation of the of the trees as a landscaping screen or a screening material yeah. and then if it changes then if he takes those trees down you're putting a wall up and I do say right in the motion to be maintained as a screening device all right yeah. I would like to make a motion move to make unless there's other conversation go for it move to make a motion to allow the existing tree line between the commercial property at 21059 Kelly and the residential property at 17672 Springer to be maintained as a screening device. This will satisfy the intent of the ordinance regarding screening. If the uh, screening device changes in the future, then um, the applicant would have to come in front of us and we'd have to make a decision. We'll review, we'll review the situation again. I'll Second. support it. Okay, motion by Mr. Burrell, supported by Mr. Lalonde. Any further discussion? Secretary, call the roll. Mr. Burrell? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Mr. DeHunt? Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman Lubeck? Yes. Flag that. We actually had Mr. Jakubiak vote yes for trees. Side note. Uh, new business item C, Ms. Van Heron. <clears throat> Trying to get there, okay. So this property is um, also the same property owner. Mark Fuga is seeking approval for a masonry wall, asking for alternative screening for property located at 21421 Kelly. Property ID 02142910060064, Obenauer Barber Lang Companies Ridgemont Park Subdivision, lots 126 to 129 inclusive. And I do have a, a memo that I'd be happy to read if you would like me to, Mr. Chair. Yes, please. So regarding the property at 21421 Kelly, the property um, was in the process of, the property owner was, in the process of erecting a privacy fence between their commercial property and the adjacent residential property. The building inspector stopped them from, from proceeding and advised that they needed approval from the Planning Commission to erect the barrier. The property changed ownership on October 25, 2019. Both adjacent commercial properties have a traditional masonry wall at 21409 Kelly and 21439 Kelly. Although the owner is requesting alternate material in the form of a PVC fence, we recommend the masonry wall that matches the existing masonry wall on both sides of their property. The ordinance section 50-2327 
indicates that once a screen wall is constructed on a common line, all subsequently constructed screen walls shall be in compliance with the requirements of this chapter and shall consist of like materials in construction with the previous constructed screen wall, unless the Planning Commission determines that the existing wall type is undesirable to maintain and continue. And then I do make a proposed motion if you wish to um, consider that. Okay, I believe this is possibly the wall that uh, was spoken about at the first hearing of the public. If you would, please come up and address your concerns with us again. Yes. My concern is that I want Again, if you would state your name. Laura Fries. Okay, I live thank at you. 17821 Veronica, which is right my backyard is there this business is to the right. I have a brick wall down my driveway. When we bought the place, we had it built 20 years ago. We had to put a fence up because we had dogs. We were allowed to put a chain link fence up. That's what we put up. There is also a chain link fence across the back. There's a church back there that changed hands and there was a masonry wall put back there. Now I have two masonry walls and a chain link fence. He started to put up a privacy fence, which as far as I know, a city ordinance is a masonry fence. And that's what I want up there. That would go all along that side. It doesn't make any sense to me to have a I mean, if it was all a pretty fence there, I would say put the pretty fence up, but it is not. It is a brick wall, and it only makes sense to have that all down the side. Okay, uh, commissioners, any questions well, since this for the resident? Since this is an evening of firsts with Mr. Jakubiak liking trees, and we all know I hate masonry walls, I have to agree. Um, I think they for consistency. I power wash the wall I, I am in agreement you know we need consistency it's a night of firsts if he can like trees I can like a masonry wall tonight um, just in the level of consistency I think it needs to be one I'm glad you came out thank you it's always important the neighbors come out absolutely especially to give their opinion on something like this I put a lot of value into what the neighbors say. So I have three different fences in my yard. I do not need another one. I saw. I, I, I have I pictures you if you want to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw your dogs. Great dogs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I have a question on that on that property, and, and not where the masonry wall is going to go. But I, I noticed between the two properties, there's like a supposed to be. It's kind of a chain link fence with a gate, but it's so, it, it's pretty ripped up and there's wires hanging and there's like a tree there. Whose property is that? Or who does that fence belong to? I can investigate that further as far as a code enforcement issue goes. I'm not sure, Ms. Ulinski. Mark Fuga, if I could add to that. Um, I, I have a photograph of her yard. I mean, I don't know what she's talking about. The she does not have any masonry wall around her yard. You have a photo there I gave you. You can see there's this, the, the, the cyclone fence along the side. The back, she has that messed up wooden fence. There's that building that her husband smokes his pot in. That's why I wanted to cover it anyway. Sir, sir, please stop right. with the personal attacks. I know it, but there, there is just a cyclone fence. There is no masonry wall by this property. You could see that I, I gave you guys a picture of the yard. Mr. Chair, actually, I too have a picture of it and I have the property and there is a masonry wall there. Yeah, there is. Next to her driveway. Well, I, I mean, it, can, can I see the picture you have? Because what I have is the whole, yeah, where, where's the masonry wall? It's not in this, you can't see it in this picture. But Please, it's maintain order in some respect driveway. here. Oh, on the other side of the, because. Right, so she has a masonry wall, the chain link, and the masonry in the back. And then there's this fence here that divides your property and... And that's a chain link. Yeah, who does that belong to? That, that it's to between done. my property and the neighbor. And what I wanted to do is put this fence up through the whole, through who, regardless of the neighbors. I was going to 
at my cost through the hole back of the property and the sides to make it all a nice fence. For, and I spoke to the doctor who rents the doctor's office. He loved the idea. In fact, I showed him these pictures and that's what he would prefer. Um, and that's what I'm asking for, rather than put a masonry wall. And, and again, I, I didn't notice any masonry wall by their house. This picture is the whole backyard, but I guess it's past the yard by the street. Correct. Um, you know, I'm not asking to do anything to make the city look bad. I'm asking to put a quality fence up through the back. I'm at, on the side where I don't have to do it, I'm going to do it also with the gate and on the other side of the property just to make it clean and good. Commissioners, do you have any questions? No. No. Someone prepared to make a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion, Mr. Chair. Uh, I make a motion to require a masonry wall of the same type, construction, and color as the adjacent masonry wall in the location shown on the site plan and located between the commercial property located at 21421 Kelly and residential property located at 17821 Veronica. Support. We have motion and support. Any further questions or comments? Mr. Lalonde? No, I, was just, I didn't know if you heard him support. Yes, we had support. Okay. Well, I know Mr. DeHunt made his comment earlier. I'll make my comment on these now is I'm not a fan of masonry walls. However, I will never tell a resident what they should have along a place where a screening device is required just to push my feelings on them. We heard from the residential property owner who says she's got two sections of masonry wall she would prefer all of it to be masonry wall. That is the requirement in the ordinance, even though it does allow us to consider other options for when there are residents that have spent considerable time and money putting up some very nice landscaping that would be lost if a masonry wall was to be erected. So that's for their protection in this case. The residential property owner wants a masonry wall there. That is the standard, so I am okay with it. Commissioners? Agree. Agree. Please call the roll. Mr. Brull? Yes. Mr. DeHunt? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman Lubeck? Yes. Okay, please get with the building department to get the necessary permits. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. New business item D, Ms. Van Heron. Just give me a minute to get there. Okay. Okay. Wissam Sawadane, I apologize for messing that up, <laughs> is seeking site plan approval for combining two parcels and developing a new retail building and parking lot at 207770 Kelly, property ID 021432-379-001, Obenauer Barber Lang Company Ridge Park, lots 1 through 749 and 750, including 20 feet vacated alley adjacent also 2076 I have to check that address I have in my notes 207621 and that can't be correct Kelly property ID 021432 379002 Obenauer Barber Lane Company 
Ridgemont Park number one through lots number one through 751 and 752 including 20 foot vacated alley adjacent so now let me find my site plan notes actually you have them. okay and miss haw has some um review for that property good evening commissioners um chris madigan from our office also worked on the site plan and he's going to present the recommendation this evening Thank you, commissioners. And um, again, if you have any problems hearing me, please let me know, and I'm happy to speak up. Um, we have reviewed we have reviewed the um, revised site, site plan application to redevelop the existing commercial site at 20770 Kelly Road. The applicant has proposed a new retail building and parking lot. Um, and at this time, we just want to note that the applicant has been diligently working with the city to achieve compliance with the zoning ordinance. This letter reflects, reflects the third site plan submission, and we just want to thank you, thank the applicant for choosing to invest in East Point, and note that in general, the revised site plan meets the zoning ordinance standards. The site plan, which, or excuse me, the site which was previously occupied by a medical office and travel agency is proposed to serve as a new retail establishment, which is permitted use in the B3 general business zoning district. The building uh, complies with the B3 building district setbacks, um, though the current configuration of the site consists of two lots and two separate buildings. With one commercial building proposed spanning both parcels, the parcels would need to be combined. The applicant uh, should submit uh, an application to combine the parcels to the building department, and this should be a condition for approval of the site plan. Um, I want to direct you down um, to uh, section 8, the landscaping and screening, uh, and note that the, the site plan complies with nearly all of the landscaping standards, um, though the applicant is requesting a waiver from Article XX, screening and landscaping, for the minimum five-foot wide landscaped greenbelt between the parking lot and Weber Street. Due to the limited rear yard, excuse me, due to the limited rear yard parking, Screening in the green belt would traditionally consist of a masonry wall, earth berm, or planting materials. Um, should, the, should the plan commission find it appropriate, the waiver would be, need to be a condition of approval for the site plan. The site plan proposes a, a, a total of 10 parking spots, which meets the minimum, and the one required ADA space. Um, a loading space is also now designated in the rear of the building, and uh, which will be used by smaller trucks and uh, um, items will be carried in on the door off Weber Street. The building elevations have also been uh, revised on sheet A300. Um, and to create a uniform appearance, the applicant has wrapped the building or the stone veneer foundation around the building and added stone veneer columns and architectural detail on each facade. Finally, um, decorative building mounted lighting is proposed for the site. Um, and while detailed specifications have not been provided on the site plan, uh, the site plan has revised with the note that any outdoor lighting shall comply with the ordinance standards of 50-162 and shall be no higher than the 10-foot parapet. Um, and so based on these findings, we recommend that the Planning Commission approve the site plan for 20770 Kelly Road at this time provided that a landscape waiver for the parking lot screening along Weber Street is found to be acceptable and uh, contingent on uh, submission of, a, of an application to combine the parcels in which the building currently sits. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Commissioners, do you have any questions for the city planner? I have a question. The applicant is requesting a waiver there's no way around it really without major work on reconfigure right their, their parking lot it reads the minimum requirements and there's really no it's not like they're putting additional parking spots in and by going you know passing on the on the landscaping requirement is that true correct there there is no additional room at the back of the site it's a, a smaller site and um, they have added landscaping and come into compliance with the other standards um, where possible okay thank you Any other questions from the commissioners? 
Is the applicant present? And could you approach the podium, please? Again, state your name and print it for us. Uh, you said print it for us? Print it on the notepad there so that we can accurately have it in the record. So I'm putting Chad Jishi on behalf of Wasam Soy down. Okay, so you're not actually the applicant, you're a representative? Correct. And how are you connected to the applicant? Um, I was his agent and uh, with him throughout the whole process when he was uh, putting the whole project together, I was assistant. Okay. Yeah. I met with the, uh, with the planner, city planner. And so I'm curious. Mm -hmm. uh, the building is coming down and a new one's going up. Is that... Uh, the majority of the building is coming down. I believe they're saving... Uh, According to the prints, they're saving some walls um, and then building onto it. So it'll be one big structure um, and then adding parking in the back and refacing, you know, the whole entire outside of the building. So what type of retail establishment is this going to be? It's a clothing business. It's a higher-end clothing business. It complements the Foot Locker store next door. All right. So we heard from the one resident who is concerned about the traffic already. Okay. Um, what kind of business hours are you looking at? What kind? I mean, you've only, we've only got, what, 10 parking spaces, I believe, is. So it's not like we're going to have a parking lot the size of Foot Locker. Right. Uh, but my concern is, and, and very valid, I think, with what the resident has said, and this goes back to when we discussed Foot Locker before, there was a resident that came up. It was concerned about the noise and the traffic of the loading and unloading of Foot Locker. Uh, so I guess the same question is valid here. Uh, when deliveries are made, you know, I am aware of retail businesses, and sometimes those deliveries can come very early. Uh, so I'm not looking for disturbances to the neighbors, and I'm concerned about traffic. So give me an idea of what your hours are going to be like. Um, what's going to happen there? Typically it's 10, 10 a.m. to... Hi, Linda Swaydan. I'm the wife of Wissam Swaydan. Okay. Um, we... We, have, we, are, we currently have a higher-end clothing business. We're just going to move our location. Um, our clients are basically, they're in and out. We've been in the business since 92. They're in and out. There's never, like, an overflow of traffic ever since 92. I've never witnessed, like, more than five or six people in the store at one time. <laughs> I'm sorry. And um, as far as shipments go, we don't get shipments early in the morning. We usually accept our shipments between 12 and 5. Okay. And we make that clear. Is your business currently in the city of East Point? Um, they're in Har we're in Harper Woods right now. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions for the petitioner? I'm just glad they're doing something with those two buildings. <laughs> They've been empty for a long time. The I mean, the it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost with the construction and what we paid for the buildings. It's going to be a $1.2 million building project, when yeah. it, a project once we're done with it. I mean, we're, our architect is like one of the best architects. <clears throat> I'm sorry, we've hired the best build, one of the best builders. I mean, he does very, very good work. And I have pictures, 3D prints of what it's going to look like. And, I mean, you guys have the plans. I see why I had to print out 12 plans. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not like we're bringing something that's and what is the name of your establishment with Sam's okay. okay thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any of the residential neighbors that would like to speak at this point in time I know you spoke earlier at the hearing the public but if you'd like to speak again this is your opportunity
With the Foot Locker, the concern, as you expressed, is again, they're in, in this two, I know they're two different businesses, but they're going to be on the same property, and I'm just concerned. And it, she said there wouldn't be that many customers at one time in the store, but like right now with the Foot Locker, there are days or occasions when they have our whole street full of cars, and they have some kind of special function. I don't know if you have any special events where you'll have a lot of uh, customers come in at, at, at one time and not have enough parking spots to accommodate everybody. Okay, and then um, the neighbor right on the corner, which would be closest to the establishment, um, she spoke with Mary, both of us went um, couple weeks ago and spoke with Mary but she's concerned also about the uh, lighting because right now and it's not even from any business right there on that side of Kelly but there's a Max Beauty Salon or something across beauty supply store across the other st side of the street and she has the lights from that business coming into her kitchen window so the concern also is about and you did someone did mention the lighting so a concern that there won't be so much light that it'll reflect into the uh, the home of that uh, person who's right there on the on the corner. Um, so those are our two issues, I guess. And noise, uh, we have a business behind us, uh, uh, some kind of auto repair place. There's a lot of noise from that. You can hear the garbage cans being empty at at uh, four in the morning or something like that. So our, the noise, the traffic, and the lighting was our our main concerns. Trust me, lighting is a main concern for me as well with all these new LED rope lightings and stuff. I, I understand that. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add, Ms. Van Heron? No, I think that the, um, the neighbor and the um, applicant covered it, and, and I did have a discussion with the neighbors about, you know, any events that are going on at there at the adjacent busy res uh, retail property that I'd certainly, you know, have discussions with them and make sure that that didn't overflow into the neighborhood. And I don't anticipate that this clothing store would have parking issues uh, overflowing into the neighborhood. I, I you know, the... I have a question now about Foot Locker. I'm certainly happy to have it there. Um, but maybe we need to be mindful, or maybe they need to be mindful about excessive use of parking for special events on the street. I don't know if some signs can be put up. You know, maybe no parking between certain hours. I mean, I, I think that it's something that needs to be investigated. I, um, I agree. Because that sounds like it's not being, it's, I mean, we want them there. We want them to be successful but they got to play with the kids around the neighborhood too. Good neighbors. Yes, we like good neighbors. And as far as the lighting goes, I think we're talking about rope lighting next month for Ms. Ulinski. Uh, maybe we need to address, and I think, uh, I believe Chairman Lubeck has addressed it in an email, the brightness of some of these lights too. Maybe we need to our ordinance actually speaks to that quite well, and, and it's tough on a code enforcement level because we don't always recognize when they are too bright. When a neighbor complains about them, we do approach the um, commercial property owner, and we we always get compliance. I mean, they, they don't really you know have any issue with complying with the ordinance. We don't go out there with light meters, but you know we make sure that the neighbors, residential neighbors, are, are satisfied with that. Okay. So we will address that with that beauty supply also. And Mary, just regarding the parking lot lighting, we have ordinances in compliance, and we make sure that every site plan is in compliance with the candlelight um, requirements and, and, and directionally how the light shines down in the parking lot. So we, that is something that is reviewed by the, the uh, professionals before it even reaches us. That's correct, it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, looking at the outstanding items, uh, waivers being requested for screening and landscaping. Commissioners? I'm content with waiving this. Just include that in the, in the motion. Yeah, there's really no room over there for added landscaping on that side. 
Okay, so we will include a waiver for that greening and landscaping. We also need in a motion that they need to submit the application to combine the parcels as required by the building department. Mr. Madigan, was there anything else we should include in the motion? No, I believe it was just those, those two items listed under the recommendation. I'd also add that in the, within the landscaping, according to the information that was published and given to us, 15% of the net usable <coughs> area of the developed site is devoted to landscape when only 10% is required. So they've gone above and beyond as far as the total. It's just a certain area does, is a little short of what we normally would require. And I think we've discussed that, so. Okay, is someone prepared to make a motion? My turn again. I move to make a motion to recommend that the planning I move to make a motion that the planning commission approve the site plan for 20770 Kelly Road including the landscape waiver for the parking lot screening along Weber as discussed and contingent on the requirement that the building department is able to combine the two existing parcels if needed second okay we've had motion and support uh, mr. Albright mr. Madigan miss Haw, is that uh, sufficient information in that motion to proceed okay seeing that that's satisfactory any other comments before we call for the vote? I would just like to thank the applicant for coming to East Point, investing in East Point. We appreciate it. We want you to be a success, so thank you. Yeah, we're excited about it, too. Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Brill. Yes. Mr. Jakubiak. Yes. Mr. Lalonde. Yes. Mr. DeHaunt. Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman Lubeck. Yes. All right, I just had to get a gigawatt into my flux capacitor here to get back to the unfinished business. Uh, we're now going to start some unfinished business. Item A, Ms. Van Heron. Proposed zoning ordinance text amendment to section 50-221 off street parking space layout standards construction and maintenance. I believe some um, additional minor changes have been made to that proposed ordinance and is ready for the Planning Commission to take action on that. Who will be addressing that this evening, Ms. Haw? Okay, yes. go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this proposed tax amendment um, deals with a reduction in parking space dimensions for off-street parking lots that are only um, to, to not be used by the general public and in a controlled environment. Um, so for an example, this would be uh, vehicles in storage waiting uh, repair. Uh, at last month's Planning Commission meeting, there was discussion on 18.B regarding the definition of low frequency. This provision has been um, reworded to further define low frequency. Mm -hmm. It states, traffic and activity of the subject vehicle shall not result in the daily turnover of the site, including but not limited to valley parking lots. That is the only additional change that has been added. Um, Mr. Albright and I did review uh, definitions for low frequency. We did not find a definition to be suitable um, for this provision. So instead, uh, we added additional language and the example of the valley parking lots so that it's clearly defined what is not acceptable. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Uh, I've, 
canvas to do. <clears throat> yeah, I've got a little problem with uh, that area in front of the building. And um, the city wants to put... Um, We're not discussing a building. No. We no. want to put boxwoods. We're not discussing a site plan. We're discussing a proposed change to the zoning ordinance for off-street parking. Oh, okay. I thought you were over there. Okay. Mr. Chair, I think we've discussed this to its finality. Uh, I think this would suffice for what Commissioner Palazzolo was looking for. I, I don't see what else we can do with this, but short of recommending it for approval. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the issue that we uh, were trying to address is identified by uh, identifying valley parking lots was the one that we were discussing. We've, this has been in front of us now for the third time. We've changed one sentence. And I, I, I agree with you. I think Mr. Palazzolo, this meets the spirit of what he was uh, concerned about. Commissioners, to move the text amendment forward, it would be a recommendation to City Council this evening for their consideration. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a recommendation or make a, a motion that we recommend to City Council the changes of the proposed zoning ordinance text amendment to section 50-221 off-street parking space layout standards construction and maintenance. Second. We have a motion to support. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. DeHunt? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Mr. Broll? Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman Lubeck? Yes. Unfinished business, item C, Ms. Van Heron. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, San J. Seth is seeking approval for a masonry wall, alternate screening, for location at 17200 10 Mile Road, property ID 02. 14291060064 halfway manor lots 1 to 7 inclusive of ex excluding the north 17 feet for road and all lots 8 to 11 including also lots 486 of assessor's plat number 30 okay do you have anything further to add ms van heron I do, ha I do have a um, uh, memo on that. I just got to dig it out now that we've rearranged the agenda. I'm not finding things so easily. I will tab everything next month <laughs> so you can more easily get there. Um, I, think, uh, I have it open if you want me to read it. Go for it. All right. So on January 28, 2020, Ms. Van Heron said the property referenced above 17200 1, 10 Mile Road had damage to the masonry wall and knee wall. Rather than replace the existing wall, they request approval to replace the brick knee wall with shrubbery and replace the wall between commercial and residential with commercial grade PVC fencing. The wall between commercial and residential be a good candidate for the PVC fencing as it is not adjacent to parking, has a grass area between the fence and the building, and the building use as office is very low impact on the residential. The replacement of the knee wall with shrubbery would add a nice landscape area to the property, and if the shrubbery hedge will serve the same pur uh, uh, and if the shrubbery hedge will serve the same purpose as the brick wall, uh, then you just have the two proposed motions here. Does that sound good? Yes. All right. Okay, are there any neighbors here to that property that would like to be heard? There's no neighbors present. The owner here. Is a petitioner or a representative present? Yes, sir, if you would introduce yourself, print your name on the notepad that is there. Sure, um, thank you. Uh, my name is Sanjay Seth. I'm the owner of the property. And for those of you who uh, are not familiar with the address but might be familiar with the name, 
I believe this is Saxony Place. The old school, wasn't it? Yes. I believe that was the old Kern School. Have you spoken to any of the neighbors around about um, what you're proposing? Uh, no, I have not. Nobody's here tonight with any opposition towards what he's asking for. I'm sorry. I apologize. Can can we restate what the request is so that I understand? I, this is this was on the agenda last month, and I reviewed it. I thought I had it. Now I'm in here and looking at my notes from last month, and I don't have it. Yeah, and on the reverse side of that memo that I wrote, there are some photographs of the existing knee wall. Um, at the sidewalk and at the side property on Saxony Street, and then also a photograph that shows the length of that masonry wall um, adjacent to the residential that's currently existing. So in looking at IMC on unfinished businesses, it's uh, seeking approval for a masonry wall, parentheses, alternative screening. So is he seeking alternative screening in lieu of a masonry wall? That's correct. Okay, Ms. Van Heren on her memorandum has provided two motions. One for the replacement of the brick knee wall with the landscaping and the other one for the replacement of the masonry wall with a PVC six foot tall fence. So let's first handle the six foot formerly masonry wall Are there any concerns with that so th will there be any masonry wall on this uh, site at all no no this so uh, okay yeah thank you yeah they will intend to remove it in its entirety adjacent to the to residential and um, replace it with if if approved the commercial grade pvc the masonry the the pvc slash masonry wall does not is not adjacent to a parking lot correct it's greenway yes okay so it's only on the maybe the east half of the south portion of the the property be on the east side the east half it's not the, the wall's not going against the entire back of the property or is it the wall does go against the entire back of the property and it's kind of hard to tell in that picture because the perspective is going out so far you're not quite catching it but there is a green belt between um any parking a large green belt and and that wall Someone prepared to make a motion? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to allow the replacement of masonry wall adjacent to 24917 Saxony, 24850 Adelaide, 24860 Adelaide with a commercial grade PVC fence six foot tall held back a distance of six feet from the sidewalk. I'll support. Support by Mr. Lalonde. The motion was made by Mr. DeHunt. Any other comments or questions, commissioners? Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. DeHunt. Yes. Mr. Lalund. Yes. Mr. Brull. Yes. Mr. Jakubiak. Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman Lubeck. Yes. Okay, now the discussion of the replacement of the brick knee wall. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to allow the replacement of a brick knee wall between. Uh, I don't think putting in those boxwoods is a good idea. My property is loaded with boxwoods, and I just removed two of them this past summer, and it has an extensive root system. They're going to choke themselves out. There's not enough room there.
the only thing you should grow there is green beans. So you're recommending they replace boxwoods with green beans? But boxwoods are not going to work. How about a tree? The roots, no. The root system is very extensive. Hmm. Miss Hall? Mary, you've only got six inches to work with. That's not enough for room. Yeah. The plan provided is not dimensioned, and I would inquire as to the spacing, if plants would be viable in that location. Okay, sir, if you could answer that question. What is the spacing there? It's about uh, 12, between 12, one foot to a little bit more than one foot ish. Enough for the boxwood or similar. Uh, I just don't know plants wise whether it's enough for the for the veg vegetable type plants. It's enough for the landscaping type structure. about greenery that meets administrative approval? Would you be open to that, Mr. Jukubiak? As, as long as it's, uh, it fits that area and it'll survive, I don't care what you put in there, but the boxwoods aren't going to work. Okay. And certainly if some um, plant material in two or three years died out, we would require replacement by something that would continue, you know, that's, that's fine. The, the, the requirement in the landscaping. But Mr. Jakubiak, you're you're ex, you know explicitly saying no boxwoods. No. Okay. Would okay. you like to amend your motion to I think it's meet, the, meet the flavor? Well, I, th I think the only change in the proposed motion would be to strike the word boxwood. Okay. Okay. All right, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to allow the replacement of brick knee wall between the parking lot and sidewalk along Saxony with landscape bricks and shrubs to a height of six to four feet, three to four, three to four feet, sorry, above the grade of the sidewalk. We have a motion. Is there support? Second. Support by Mr. Jakubiak. Any further discussion, questions? Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. DeHunt? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Broll? Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman Lubeck? Yes. That brings us to the Thank public you. hearing. Thank you. I ask one thing real quick. Why was he in front of us? What drove him to be in front of us? What's that? Yeah. No, but I mean, why is he in front of the planning commission? Is it, was there a change? Ms. Van Heron? Or why, why is he in front of the planning commission? Oh, because their masonry wall um, suffered damage and it was falling down, and so did the knee wall, and so they were crumbling and breaking down, and so we required that they, uh, if they we required repair, and they at that point wanted to um, request the alternate material. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, we're at the point where we would normally have the public hearing, but I think the public hearing might go a little bit smoother and be more on point. Uh, we have the representatives here from Habitat and Ford. They gave a small presentation at the City Council meeting on Tuesday, and I believe they are prepared to do the same thing tonight. And that may answer a lot of questions that some of the people are here and have. So if you would proceed. Well, first of all, good evening. Uh, my name is Helen Hicks. I'm the president and CEO of Macomb County Habitat for Humanity. And once again, I want to thank you for inviting us uh, and to be in your presence. It's really quite an honor and to be here in East Point. 
Uh, just to clarify how we even found ourselves here with the word container homes, because I know there's been some discussion. Um, we, we basically uh, had the opportunity to have uh, several of Ford's brightest and best 30 under 30 uh, come to Habitat, and they spent about a year with us. And they looked at the things we did really well and the things we didn't do so well. And one of the things they found that we weren't doing really well is we were serving people, uh, we were providing low-income housing. In fact, we've done 15 homes here in East Point, um, which means 15 tax-paying citizens, because we don't give away homes, we sell homes. Um, and we're gonna be working on about eight more in the next coming year, just so you guys know. But um, Ford said to us, you know, you're, you're serving a lot of people who earn about 24,000 and up, um, but we're really not serving people who are uh, earning about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 to twenty-three. that one little gap right there. And those are the folks that are maybe working in restaurants and service sector, and they're, we're just not, they're not able to find a way to gain home ownership. So they said, um, they, they left the program and then they surprised us and they submitted a grant and it was a national grant competition and there were two winners and have their grant here, these bright people behind me, their grant was uh, selected as one of those two grants. And it was to um, build two container homes. So we had a meeting at Habitat and we invited all the cities and municipalities to come Ford did a presentation and then all of those cities, you know, went back to their offices and they submitted, some of them submitted proposals. Um, East Points was the best written, the best received. It, it was amazing. Um, I, I don't remember if it was economic development or whatever who did it, but it was amazing. So they received a unanimous vote. Um, and um, so that's how we're here today. These folks have worked, I can't even tell you how many hours on this concept. Um, and whenever you partner with Ford, I have to tell you, it's like excellence. Uh, even the budget they submitted, I mean, it's pages and pages long. You know, one bolt is this much money. You know, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. So, um, what they want to do tonight is do the presentation, and then we'd like to answer some questions if possible. Um, I did, there's a real estate agent here to talk about, because I know some people had some concerns about would their property value go up, down, whatever. Um, and I, those are really important, those are really important things to us to make sure that your questions are answered, you know. Um, so, I'm going to turn it over to Ford, and let's see what they can say to us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wesley Berkman. I'm a technical specialist at Ford. I've been with the company for about 10 years. Um, I've been working on housing with different nonprofits in six different states. Um, as uh, Helen mentioned, this project kind of came about due to my personal interest in small homes and building and creating. Um, and then we met with Habitat and you know, we submitted a grant application that was required to be in partnership with a non-government organization, a nonprofit. Um, and then now we're at the point where we're trying to find if there's a municipality that wants to partner with us in extending Habitat's ability to serve the community to a lower demographic than they were able to before. Um, so I'm actually going to hand it right over to some other people from Ford who are on our team and they're going to introduce themselves as they go and uh, we'll attempt to go through the presentation in a good amount of time and feel free to tell us if we need to move ahead or change, uh, change our method tonight. Thank you. Yeah, got Hi everyone, my name is Eric Holm. I work at the Corporate Strategy Department at Ford Motor Company. I've been with them for about three and a half years. Um, and I've been actually building homes with, non, with a Habitat for Humanity since I was 18 years old. And so I've had a really good opportunity to know more about the mission of what it means to build affordable housing for working families. And um, this project is something very, very unique. I've built homes in eight different housing sites across the states and never before have I seen such an innovative idea where we could actually reach people who are much more in need than we uh, cater today. And one of the things that Habitat for Humanity at Macomb County believes is that everyone deserves a decent, affordable place to live. And families really are served best with home ownership because with home ownership, people 
feel a more stable place to live. They're actually, um, they actually have a, they actually have more time to worry about working more. Kids are allowed to have this good place to study so that they don't have to worry about, you know, if they're going to move to another school district or not. And so with this sort of increased sense of stability, families are actually lifted up above where they're at currently. Um, Habitat for Humanity uh, has gives a hand up and not a handout. And what that means, as Helen mentioned, is these working families actually buy the homes that Habitat for Humanity builds. And so a lot of the homes that we have traditionally built in the past are a little bit bigger, but with the larger size, they tend to cost a lot more, between 100000 to about even $150,000. And um, those tend to be really, really expensive. And so what tends to happen is we can only cater towards working families who make at least $24,000. Um, and if you do the math, that equates to about $11, $12 an hour. And that is if you get 40 hours of work, of work a week. And so what's really tough is there's a lot of working families out there who don't have that opportunity to work full time and are not getting those $11, $12 an hour, uh, 11 or $12 wage. And so I think this is a good opportunity to really expand the the people that Habitat for Humanity serves. And so I'll just pass it along to Lonnie, who will talk to you more about the opportunity. I'm Lonnie Duffy. I'm an attorney at Ford Motor Credit Company, the financial arm of Ford Motor Company. I do consumer finance work as well as corporate governance work. And so it was me and Wesley who came up with the idea and wrote the application. And our impetus for this idea was our company's commitment to mobility and efficient land use and how do we get people closer to the, where they work and where they play. And so container homes was one idea that we came up with as a way to bring people closer to their communities and closer to each other, as well as provide affordable housing, as Eric just explained. We want to provide housing for lower pro price points and something that could be, you know, for a starter home for a young family, as well as maybe a home that they're downsizing when somebody's retiring. It could be a home during somebody's lifetime. What, when we wrote this application, we looked around at the market and said, hey, there's not a lot of affordable housing out there. The housing is either you live in an apartment or you have to get a larger size home that has a larger monthly payment. And that's one of the key things is this brings down the monthly payment for folks so that they can afford that dream. They can afford the American dream of home ownership. We targeted Macomb County in particular because Macomb County is part of the tri-community area and Detroit's been the one that's been getting all of the attention lately with all new concepts. We wanted to bring Macomb County into that because Macomb County needs to be part of the new wave of the future with mobility and smaller and more efficient land use. And so that's why we chose Macomb County. And we're so excited to have East Point and be talking to you today. And now I'll turn it over to my friend Weston. Good evening, everybody. My name is Weston Polizzi. I'm a buyer and purchasing at Ford. So I negotiate all the contracts, um, the parts that go in your vehicle. So I will be going over the concept today. Um, a brief overview of our two concept designs um, and to see some pictures of them. So again, I, I spoke, we have two designs, we have two concepts. Our first concept is the larger of the two concepts at approximately 600 square feet. Um, our price target for this home is $75,000. And one very important point about these homes, both of these containers, is the build time. Can you make it a little bit bigger, please? Too big? How about that? Good? Okay. Um, it is a six to eight week build time uh, in comparison to a traditional eight to 10 month build process for a home. So in 600 square feet for $75,000, uh, the first concept has two full bedrooms, a full kitchen, and a full bath. 
So this is the first concept. Like I said, this is the larger of the two. This is 600, approximately 600 square feet. I am not an architect, and I'm not going to try to use any terminology in front of the commissioners here. But uh, personally, I love this design, uh, specifically the skylights up top. Um, not only does that bring a unique design feature, it also helps bring in natural light, a lot more so than my home. Um, and then one thing, these are renderings. Um, and one cool fact about these renderings, these are done by the people who sculpt, uh, sculpt and design the cars of tomorrow. They're actually helping us with these designs. So there's a little bit of automotive influence in these designs, which as a car guy, I find really cool. Um, and these are renderings. So as we continue to refine uh, this project, the more we engage with the city, uh, all the stakeholders, the neighbors in the neighborhood, and of course the homeowners, we, uh, these will be refined as an example we've already talked about. Instead of stone, maybe some brick and veneer to match uh, the neighborhood. But again, those will be refined as we continue through the project. And this is the other side uh, facing Neal Street. Um, again, this is something else that we've talked about. Nels, sorry, sorry, Nels. Um, and then this, like this one will be facing Nels. So here is the layout of concept one. This is, uses two containers. What you see in blue is the containers. So up top you have a 40 foot container and at the bottom you have a 20 foot container. Now housed in the 20 foot container is all the plumbing. So you have the bath and the kitchen in one area. Again, full bath, full kitchen. Um, in the middle to add square footage, we'll be building um, what we're calling a breezeway. Um, in that breezeway, you'll have a full living room, a full down, uh, full down dining room table, um, and TV. We'll also have a study room between both bedrooms and a patio. So now we're moving on to the second concept. Uh, concept two is smaller than the first at approximately 400 square feet. Um, our cost target is a very important $50,000. Um, it's the same six to eight week build time as the first home. So the first bullet point is very important, um, and my team, our team has touched on this, but um, at $50,000, this equates to a $355 monthly housing cost. So what that means is a working family or working individual who never thought of owning a home can now entertain that idea at this price point. And that is very important. Um, again, but with this 400 square feet and that, that price point, we still get two full bedrooms, a full kitchen, and a full bath. So this is, again, a rendering um, of the first, or sorry, of the second concept. one side and here's the other side again this will be refined as we continue continue through the project here's a nice design element up top you can see um, and then here's a brief uh, layout I'll go to the next slide gives a more detailed layout okay so here there's these are the 40 and 20 con foot containers side by side this time so again, like the last home, two full bedrooms, a living room, a dining table, a full kitchen, a full bath, and actually two patios. So this is one very cool thing. Um, our friends at the studio were able to actually put the actual rendering on, uh, on Nels. So right here is the actual street uh, as it lies today with the concept on it. And that's our presentation. What? Yep. Yeah, so uh, I'm coming back for a little bit. So as I mentioned, I'm the engineer. I'm the uh, technical side behind the group. Um, we have a potential questions section, which I'm going to skip over here because I imagine that it's going to be some back and forth between the planning council and any questions for the residents. Um, from a technical perspective, um, you guys saw the pictures there. Um, the intention, I won't go through it all and bore people the details, but the intention is to build a home that meets the existing Michigan Residential Code, which I think East Point follows the 2015 version, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, um, inside of a container home shell. Um, there's a very, I can count on one finger the number of building variances that we would be in discussion um, with doing. So uh, two by four construction, two by six, double, uh, double two by six headers, two by six rafters, 24 inches on center, um, ceiling methods. So uh, we're not trying to build something that's uh, significantly different than the homes that you all build in, but we are building it smaller and we are building it, uh, hoping to build it inside of a container. Um, some people might have the question of why a container home? 
Um, I have a personal interest in it. Uh, I think it's very cool. A lot of people our age think it's very cool. Um, there's been a lot of media coverage on it, but the primary reason is it's uh, more cost effective. Um, if we're going to try and build a home for a certain demographic, um, the first way to allow them the American dream of home, home ownership is to build smaller. And so then the second question is, given a certain amount of money, how can we maximize the amount of space that we can give them? And if we build a container home as opposed to traditional construction, we can build something that is 10, 15, possibly even 20% bigger for the same price point. Um, so that's one of the major things that put us into this container home concept. Um, other notable things about this, um, Weston mentioned uh, Weston mentioned that there is a um, single wet wall, as we call it. So that's just one of the things that as you build a smaller home, and with container homes, when you put the bathroom and the kitchen next to each other, you only have one wall in the entire home that is wet. And so you're talking about plumbing costs that are 30%, 25% um, of, a, of a typical build. Um, the rest of the technical information would probably bore us. Um, but I'm happy to go into it with anybody that has questions tonight. Um, so next steps, um, we are here to solicit feedback from you guys. As we mentioned, we came up with a concept. We partnered with a nonprofit. Um, but the real stakeholders are the city. The real stakeholders are the surrounding residents. And the real stakeholders are even the future um, owners of this. One of the things that's really cool about building a home for Habitat that you can build in um, six to eight weeks as opposed to eight to ten months is we don't have to start building the home before we have an applicant identified. And so we can actually identify an applicant and take their feedback in um, as we design the home with an interior designer and with uh, the studio team at Ford that's working with us. Um, so this is really the time when we get to meet with the stakeholders for the first time. And so we're more about receiving feedback from you guys rather than telling you what the concept is or has to be. Um, so with that, that's the end of our presentation. Um, I'm not sure where you'd like to take it from here. Just one technical question at this point. What is the typical dimensions of a container? Yep, so a shipping container, they usually come in a 40-foot length and a 20-foot length. Um, we're going to be using two of those. They are both going to be what's called a high cube container, which means it's 9 feet 6 inches tall on the exterior, and it allows for a fully framed finished 8-foot ceiling on the inside. Um, the width of a finished shipping container as it's built into a home, if you're building with the Michigan Residential Code and 2 by 4 walls, is 7 feet wide. Um, and so, uh, for example, that, that would be the width of the bedrooms. Um, for the living room and the kitchen space, we've overlapped them in about a 10-foot opening between the containers. So we've attempted to make those one long room as much as possible, but 40 feet and 20 feet. What did you say the typical width was? So the interior uh, the shipping containers are 40 feet and 20 feet long and 8 feet wide on the exterior. And so after you get the corrugated sides, for, uh, 2 by 4 walls and uh, dry walls, that's a 7 foot interior width. For this project, are you using, are you proposing to use used containers or new containers? So we'd probably get a gently used container. We could get new ones, but I don't think we have to. Correct me if I'm wrong, but every container that's used in a container home environment has to go through a certification, whether it's used or not. Is that true? Um, I'm not aware of that myself. Uh, one thing that we'll run into is um, there is uh, some of this is a learning process because not many of these have been built. Um, are, are, you, are you talking about it, its past use, or are you talking about its structural integrity, if I could ask? Not, not, not integrity, but, but prior use, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so for prior use, um, we have addressed that in one of our proposed questions. Um, two examples that I think a, a prior resident brought up. Um, every shipping container is treated with a pesticide on its flooring. That's any time you transport wood across country barriers, it's required to either be kiln dried or be pesticide treated. Um, so the type of pesticide is stamped on the outside of every shipping container. So we would plan on choosing our shipping containers based on any less hazardous pesticides that are chosen and also ones that have a lower vapor pressure, the ability for it to off-gas and actually be breathed in. Um, we're also going to be covering the floor with a product called AMF Safe Coat Safe Seal, which is specifically designed for sealing polyurethane, OSB, and, and uh, construction materials so that it doesn't off-gas as much. 
Um, in terms of what, what did the container carry previously, did it carry something that might have residues that are left on it? Um, it's difficult to track the prior life of a container, but the inside of the container is going to be fully insulated with closed cell polyurethane spray foam. And so that's an effective vapor barrier. And so any residue that could even be on the interior surface of the container won't be able to be accessed by the occupant. What about the exterior? The exterior? The exterior? So uh, are you talking, about, once again, from a chemical perspective? Or? To me, if, you know, if you've got containers going across the ocean, chances are they're painted with lead or they're painted with something that's going to withstand the elements, mm -hmm. salt water, whatever you want to call it. How are the outsides treated? You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I look at these containers and I expect to see the word Hanjin on the side of one mm -hmm. of them. Um, so my concern, you know, <laughs> my, I have many concerns. Uh, but starting with this, the exterior, how do we know that the exterior is safe? How do we know it's not painted with lead? How do we know, how do we just, how do we know that these containers, you're saying the inside you can clean up and treat and do this and do that and make it safe. But what about the exterior? We used to have asbestos sided houses that are illegal now. Mm -hmm. And those were on the outside. It wasn't on the inside. Mm -hmm. So how, what do you do with the outside? Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that's a good thing worth considering. Um, I think one of the benefits in this case is there's a minimal quantity of different materials used in the building of a container. Of a container. Um, we would plan on painting the containers and having them sprayed before we install any type of exterior cladding, which is something that we come to an agreement on with the residents and with East Point. Um, the best thing I do is probably just chip some of the paint off and take it to a lead test. Um, I mean, similar to if you bought a used home, uh, lead-based paint, I think you have to send out a notification or um, uh, they have to notify all homeowners of prior lead paint. So I would probably do the same thing you do if you bought a used home and um, take a sample of the paint and do a lead test on it. Do you have an image of a completed home, not the fancy schmancy one owned in Ferndale or Royal Oak. I'd like to see a relevant image of an existing property because this is like looking at a menu. You know, you see that lovely steak in the, on the menu and then when it comes to you, it's completely different. So we're looking at these lovely artist renderings. Do you have an image of a completed property? And if I can build on it, maybe do you even have constructions in Metro Detroit that we would have an address that you can provide to us? Do I? I just didn't hear you. Do you have what? You have address. Do you have any constructions of this similar nature in Metro Detroit that we could go look at? Mm -hmm. So the best property that I think I would point at, and I I only have the presentation on the flash drive, so I don't have any images, but I think we could make them available. Um, the best thing I'd probably point you to is there's a very relevant building in uh, or cons uh, lot in Benton Harbor. Um, it's made of two uh, shipping containers put together just like this and sealed and connected together. Um, that's probably the best one that I'd point you guys to, but I don't have pictures of it on my flash drive right now. Is that a Habitat property? Uh, no, it's a personal build. So in order for us to permit your container houses to come here, we have to change our ordinance from 880 square feet to 600. My feeling is, why should we lower our standard to meet your container? Why don't you raise your container to meet our ordinance? Okay. Um, can, can, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, can I j jump in real quick? Should we review, because I think there's, city administration has provided the different options for the Planning Commission. Um, I don't think it's necessarily has to be exactly what you're saying, Mr. Jakubiak. Um, up to you, Mr. I, Mr. Well, let me make a comment at this point. Uh, based on uh, Mr. Jakubiak's comment, as well as the firestorm that's been on Facebook for the last couple of weeks. There are many different ways to approach this. One is to change our minimum building standards in the city. We had a discussion on that last month at the Planning Commission, if memory serves me correct. And the Planning Commission unanimously was not in favor of lowering our minimum building standards. By doing that, you end up with a situation that's called build by right, 
which means anybody could go on to any pr residential property in East Point, and as long as they met those minimum requirements, they could build. And the Planning Commission was not in favor of that. There was a question asked. Uh, we received an email this afternoon or this morning discussing possi other possibilities that would allow developments like this, but on a case-by-case -case basis, and also while at the same time as allowing that, not requiring us to lower our minimum building standards to accommodate it. And that's probably where this discussion is going to go when we get to that agenda item. But right now, we are trying to get to a hearing of the public because there are a lot of people here. And based on that response just a moment ago, they have some concerns and they have some opinions. So I just wanted to know if the commissioners had any other technical questions that could be answered. And actually, Mr. Jakubiak, they've already answered your question. It's cost. If you go larger, the cost of the house is going to be more. Well, I have a few other questions about the house. Mm -hmm. Number one, I have some information here that says the roof on a container house, the roof on a container is not very strong. Okay, so you're going to need another roof. Plus, you need another roof for drainage of snow <coughs> and water. Otherwise, it's going to sit up there and eventually rust right through. Um, what was the other thing I wanted to do? How are you insulating this? Okay. Um, so I'm actually going to use this opportunity to scroll back up to some of the potential questions because specifically the, um, the insulation one is, uh, is addressed there. Um, I'll, oh, sorry, we're going the wrong way. So I'll start with the insulation question, and I'll move on from there. Let's see. That was the last potential question. Um, so are container homes cold in the winter and hot in the summer? Um, this is a question that gets floated on forums about shipping container homes often. Um, that's usually often because they're being built somewhere where they're not attempting to meet uh, local building codes. Um, with just the clientele that's on those type of forums. Um, so this Habitat container home, as I mentioned, we're attempting, attempting to build a home that meets the existing Michigan residential code and that meets the existing Michigan energy code. And so the walls are going to be two by four walls. That's on the inside of the corrugation. So the portions of the corrugation go towards the outside that adds to the average thickness of the wall. Um, it's going to have two by six ceilings with space above and the, <coughs> the floor system of the shipping containers is a five and a half inch um, C-channel truss system underneath the floor. Uh, it's all going to be sprayed with closed cell polyurethane spray foam. Um, so we're going to have R23 walls, R45.7 ceilings and R32.3 floors. Um, so this will exceed the existing Michigan residential or Michigan energy code for this zone, uh, heating zone or thermal zone they call it. Um, secondly, the heating and cooling system for the home is going to be oversized, for lack of a better word, simply because they don't really make heating and cooling system, systems for 400 and 600 square foot homes, and so it's going to have a heating and cooling system that's significantly oversized. Um, so those two things together, combined with the fact that you're starting with a shipping container structure that's fully welded and fully sealed, so it's not a patchwork of 4x8 OSB shorts, uh, sheets with tape across them and then uh, and then thermal wrapped and then vinyl sided. Um, it's going to be starting with a very tight building envelope. So I expect that this will um, be equal to or better than the uh, thermal behavior of the existing homes in the neighborhood. Um, if I could uh, go on to the roofing question, um, I think that that is a rather technical question. Um, the roof of a shipping container itself, uh, I would not say that it is weak, but I would say that it is not stiff. Um, so the entire um, structure of a shipping container is welded core 10 steel. Um, it is very strong, but it is not very stiff. You can look at a video of somebody walking along the top of a shipping container and you'll see it move because that's not intended to take, that's not required to um, be stiff against loads. If a shipping container is sitting on a boat and there's snow on top of it, nobody cares if the roof um, deforms down three quarters of an inch or something like that. Um, but as I mentioned in the 
technical presentation. We're meeting the existing Michigan residential code two by four walls, two by six ceilings, and spray foam insulated. Um, so we're going to have a supplemental framing that meets the Michigan residential code inside of that skin. Um, we're not installing any type of rooftop decks or anything. So other than snow, snow load, we don't expect additional load on the roof. I have another question. Yep. Uh, all container houses you're showing are sitting right on the ground. Is that the way they're going to be built? Uh, when you say the ones I'm showing, you're talking about these concepts right here? No. You get some pictures. Okay. Yeah, so this, uh, this rendering, for example, this is our studio team. Um, so uh, they did the best that they could with the time that they were given. No, a shipping container home cannot sit on the ground. It has to have at least six to eight inches of space underneath. It is a metallic structure, so you don't want to completely seal off the bottom for, um, for humidity and ventilation. So the shipping container home would have to sit between six and eight inches off the ground with some type of skirting, um, aesthetic skirting around that that we would come to some agreement on. So they'll be sitting on some sort of a foundation? Yes. Okay. Because um, the way I see it, all your utilities, except for electrical, are going to come from underground. Yes. Now, that area underneath the, the container house should be insulated because this is cold weather. Mm -hmm. When your water comes up, if you don't have that well insulated, it's going to freeze. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my feeling is you're going to need to dig a rat wall cement and then put a foundation of block about this high all the way around with maybe one little opening and then insulate that very well doesn't that add to the cost so um if we think about a traditional home, a traditional home has the water supply line which comes into a location, has the sanitary connection which comes into a location, and then it might spider out and it might go to multiple fixtures, kitchen here, bathroom here, bathroom there, uh, over to a wall so it can pass up to a second floor bathroom. Um, because we mentioned that the um, that we only have one wet wall in the entire in the entire home. That means that um, we're already including in our cost the moving of the sanitary and supply lines to align to the house. Um, it can come up with one in one location at the side of the house. Um, so I definitely agree that, um, well, it's really up to East Point to, to guide us in this. Um, we, need, we know that we need a rat wall. Um, we know we need aesthetic skirting around the bottom of there. Um, but in terms of area and location that actually even has plumbing underneath the house, um, we're talking about essentially a um, 10 square foot area. So right now the plan is to build up, um, in, in, in addition to any type of skirting or rat wall that's necessary, uh, to build up and insulate and then heat that space right there. Um, but that is a relatively small percentage of the square footage of the overall home. Okay. Um, I have some, some literature here that I got off the internet. Okay. It says here, Structural issues. A shipping container may vary, may be very strong at the corners, but the roof is not that strong. So typically, you need to build another roof over it. And that, that's just common sense because you have to have some sort of drainage for rain and snow. Okay? Uh, and that's what it says here. Also, the corrugated steel walls are important to the structure the strength of the structure. This means that when you cut into the large windows or door opening, new <coughs> reinforcement has to be in place. Now, is that all figured in to the price of the, uh, the container home? So if I, uh, I'll answer the cutting open of questions first. Um, let me see. Uh, so we see here, any cuts in the container structure are supported with welded steel reinforcements. I don't know if I can zoom in on this. Uh, apparently I can. Um, but you can see in every place that we've proposed a cutout, that's, it's one of the common practices for a shipping container home. Anytime you cut in a hole in a structural wall, you have to reinforce it. Um, so there is quarter inch steel reinforced welding assumed, um, included in our cost as well for every opening, uh, windows and doors. And uh, if I were um, to go on to the roof question, I think I uh, addressed it before that the roof of a container, I think the right way to say is it's not stiff, um, but it's going to be supported by the interior framing built in the, the shipping container, which is um, the same type of framing that you'd have in a traditional home. 
I have a couple non-technical questions. We have this infamous thing in the city called the East Point Residence Group. You can be savaged for the simplest thing, and you can just imagine the dialogue that has been going on about container homes. Uh, there's been some comments made about turning us into a low-income uh, community. You know, we already have the Grafton Manor. We have the Deerfield Project that will be going online. We have the Barry Towers. We have this, you know, and so now we're, we're bringing more low-income housing in. Perfectly fine. I love Habitat for <laughs> Humanity. I love the fact that they've done 15 homes. We have another eight going. To my knowledge, I think the city has a lot more tax reversion properties that you can probably get for a good price. Why don't we give these? Um, I, I concede that this is hip, it's cool, it's fresh. We're not Ferndale, we're not Royal Oak, we're not Birmingham. And I understand that tides change, and I understand that people have different wants and different needs. And I've also known and I've also seen a lot of negative comments made about people thinking that, oh, well, if you don't go for it, you're against vets. I was at the last council meeting when the lady from Habitat very eloquently said that the vets are a favorite of theirs, but not necessarily going to be the only ones to get it. Uh, I was also at a meeting prior to that where it was the comment was made during a presentation that they're already working on vets to put into the properties, which I found disconcerting because no ordinance has been changed. Nothing's been done. We had a presentation at City Council yesterday prior to this meeting. If you look at the Macomb Daily, it's practically as though we're, we've already, it's already been done. Um, so I guess I feel like we're getting beaten over the head. And I'm not looking for, I'm, I'm just trying to express what I have been reading on this residence group and some of the things that I've heard from a lot of people across all age demographics racial demographics, sexual demographics. I've heard it all from a lot of people. On my Facebook page, I get blown up, people sending me messages with real concerns. So, again, nothing personal against you folks, but I hope you've done your research and actually looked at that god-awful residence page because it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. Um, I don't like the concept of a tiny home. I think everybody, vet, underprivileged, whatever it is, deserves 880 square feet. To answer your question, sir, we have looked at the comments on the Facebook page and we welcome input from the community. We're here today to get input from you and going forward to work with you on what you want to see on these properties. The cons. That could be part of a different project, but this particular grant is for container homes, and we would like to have them in some place in Macomb County. However, please. The public will be given their opportunity to speak in a few minutes. Let's uh, have some decorum here. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to jump in real quick. Um, first of all, so a lot of your comments, Mr. DeHaunt, were of course, I mean, the Ford Fund folks are putting the project together and then Habitat is handling applications and uh, city administration's doing certain things and the city council's of course responsible for certain things. I know your comments were to to everyone so of course it's it's not like Ford funds responsibility to um, answer the change in ordinance questions that'd be City Council after of course you guys review it so I just want to keep keep that in mind as I guess we we go about it um, 
and hear from the residents on what they're thinking and that sort of thing. Could I add Thanks, one Mr. thing? Chair. Could I add just one thing? Yes, please. If, if the flavor of the day or the press or whatever is that, you know, uh, it seems like it's happening, um, it, 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 it seemed like it was happening for us as well because we received a fantastic proposal. When you receive a proposal from a city, you know, you, you get the sense that the city is very excited about a cutting edge opportunity. It isn't like we were coming in and doing a community of homes. We were proposing one or two. Um, and we actually, we weren't proposing it. East Point proposed it to us. So I, I want, that's why I started out the conversation by, you know, mentioning that that actually did happen. And we were so excited. My, you know, my first home was in East Point on Agnes. And I just remember, you know, well, I was younger then. <laughs> that was many years ago. But I just remember the friendliness of the city. And, um, and I love, I really do love East Point. I have great memories. So I know, you know, it would be probably be different if we were bringing in, you know, a hundred of these, but we were trying to find a couple of lots where we could do something really innovative, innovative and really well done. I mean, Ford is like the perfect partner because have you ever seen anything that Ford does where it's not perfect? It's beautiful. Focused. The Pinto, the Etzel. Oh. <laughs> Okay, well, lately, okay, well, lately. But anyway, um, I, I tell you, I'm, I really hope that you think this through and maybe possibly allow us to even try, you know, try one and see how, see what the community thinks about the first one and then, you know, move from there, so. Um, the, uh, the only other thing I was gonna mention is I know that um, one of the primary concerns that was on that Facebook page, which we did look, for, look through, was home, home values. Um, so I'd just like to make sure that we um, give an opportunity to uh, present on that topic because we did bring a, real, a, a broker with us um, who has done some research. Um, and yeah, just a second, um, second Helen's thing. We have a concept, we partnered with a, a nonprofit and then we were asked to come here by East Point. Um, to come, you know, we were proposed in order to come here. So um, many of the questions, these are, you guys are the partners that we're looking to answer these questions with. Um, but I think I'd like, uh, sorry, you had a? Yeah, uh, is there another city that's doing this and are they changing their ordinance? Um, Mr. Chair, I, kn I know that we'll hold the public hearing. Um, we also have our economic development uh, manager here, Kim Homan, and I'd like to give her at some point, either now or during that public hearing, an opportunity to speak to the public and to the planning commissioners regarding our tax reversion homes that we, that we do have. Yes, I observe she stood up and walked over there, so I was just going to invite her to the microphone because it appears she does have something to say and is rather eager to say it. Yep. And we have Tracy, our broker, as well, so um, we can probably work them in, and then we'd like to get everybody's comments. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Kim Homan, Economic Development Manager. Um, I am in the process of, of uh, rounding up our city council to do a working session regarding the current condition and status of our tax-reverted properties. I've been in every one. Um, we, have, we will be presenting within the next week or two. Um, sadly, many of these homes have been sitting for over two years and are in very bad condition. There are foundation issues. All of them are going to need new kitchens, new bathrooms. Um, the recent, uh, the city council last fall approved um, a sale of four of the properties to Community Housing Network, one of our local partners, and it's being estimated that in addition to the $25,000 cost to purchase the properties, there's going to be anywhere from $55,000 to $120,000 that's going to need to be done to bring these back, these houses back to, um, to code. That is um, not, you know, obviously this, that is not a solution for people that, um, you know, on, on smaller incomes um, by the time the, the work is done. So um, sadly, the, these houses are in, in very poor condition. Some of them are head to, you know, ceiling to floor mold, um, 
basements are flooded. Um, there's some of them have so much debris that you can't even get into the basement. Um, it, it is a, it's a, yeah. But that's something that we were going to work out with the with the city council um, and, and talk to them about plans for those properties moving forward. You know, the Sorry. one thing that bothers me is bringing more low, uh, low cost housing here. We have two of them over here for seniors. We have Oakwood, and then we have a new one going in uh, where the school property is. How much more do we need? You know, you keep dragging low cost housing here, and this city's going in the toilet. And today it's two. How many will it be a year from now? Well, that's going to be based on how successful these two are. Could and you I define success? What um, do you mean by successful? That they look pretty and people move into them? It's, it's, I think it's going to be a combination of factors, including how they fit within the community. You know, initially they were for, for, for uh, veterans. I'm a veteran. So I know what some of these people have gone through. I will not stick them in a 600 square foot container, period. What? Um, and so Wesley, you're on, on the technical side, so I'm only going to give an opinion. Don't want to pretend like it's anything else. Um, for the approximately 18% of residents in East Point who are living at the poverty level or below, um, we're trying to open up home ownership to that segment of the existing population of residents of East Point. Um, so you mentioned that there's been some affordable housing which has been brought in. Um, I'm not familiar with those projects. I don't know what they are. Um, but it's probably reasonable to say that a significant part of that renting is probably also subsidized. Um, and so if we talk about somebody, the type of person that we're trying to allow Habitat to serve in this time, it's a person who is already living in a 600 square foot apartment um, and is having 70% uh, of the cost of that subsidized. So if we talk about why do we need more low income ho housing or something like that, um, the type of housing you're talking about is the type of housing which is costing taxpayers at large money because the majority of it is probably subsidized. Um, and it is also not allowing that homeowner to accrue um, equity. It's also not generating as much tax revenue for the city. Um, so if we talk about somebody um, sticking somebody into a home that's 600 square feet, you're talking about taking somebody who is currently um, able to afford their existing 600 square foot living space because of the generosity of the community um, and who is not generating tax revenue for the city and is not um, using that 600 square foot apartment as a sense of economic and social mobility. So um, we're talking about people that are already in that existing square footage size. Um, we're talking about uh, removing, removing liability on the community in terms of subsidizing that housing because they're going to be able to afford the, the monthly payment for this without subsidization. Um, we're talking about taking properties that are currently not performing any taxes and we're talking about adding tax revenue to the city. Um, and we're also talking about doing it in a way that allows them to have economic and social mobility. Um, so yes, they are both square, 600 square feet. Um, this is a low-income house, but this is a low-income house that removes um, negatives and adds positives compared to some of the other low-income options that are available. Um, so I'd also like to mention that uh, the potential homeowners will be designing the homes with us, so they do have a choice of moving and actually buying this house. So it's not like we're forcing them into it. If they would like to wait for a bigger house, they're actually more than welcome to do so. Um, so we're really, the whole design process is everyone is involved, including the home, potential homeowner. And so we're just hoping to uh, uh, make sure that they're, they are fully aware that they're moving into a smaller home. So okay. Yeah. Please, this is not a question and answer session uh, with the public. And the people here. The commissioners are trying to ask some questions to get some answers to the public so that when we give you an opportunity to speak, maybe a lot of the common questions have already been answered. But I think this brings this whole issue brings probably a bigger discussion that needs to be had with city council in this city. 
Is that the direction you want to take our city so that we have to change the signs at the entrance to our city from the gateway to Macomb County to East Point, Michigan's affordable housing capital? So. I want to attract people here these, these housing projects, the, the last three that have been put in, have been put in under a pilot. Payment in lieu of taxes. Because if we actually charged the going rate for taxes that the rest of the hard-working citizens in this community are paying, they wouldn't be affordable. When you say people that are earning just a couple dollars more than minimum wage, and it's great that they own homes. Can they afford to support the businesses in the community with any expendable income? Well, it doesn't sound like they have much. And I have the same concern I've seen expressed on Facebook. If we keep going after all these affordable housing things, it's like a race to the bottom. We're suffering now because of the housing crunch Proposal A and Headley, we'll never get back to the tax income we once had in this city. Every year at budget time, we're scraping to find pennies to keep things, to improve things. And we're talking about taking a lot where you could build a house that otherwise might have a market value of $130,000 and putting a $50,000 house on that property and getting less tax money. That's what concerns me. So, I mean, Mr. Lubeck, I think what I'm uh, kind of gathering from your comments is that you seem to not care about our lower income residents. There you go. Go ahead and twist it, Mr. DeMonico. I care about low income people. But why do I have to throw my investment in my home out the window? Because this community is going to become the low income capital of Michigan. How many other communities are there and how many of their houses, of these houses are being put there? Why is it East Point's responsibility to provide a low income house for every low income family? First of all, there's shipping containers in other communities and I haven't heard of some massive reduction in property values. As we said, we have someone- 400 square foot and 600 square foot container houses? I don't think so. Yeah, there's a $429,000 one in Birmingham. So. Nine containers. I, okay, so <clears throat> I get that, but we also already have homes that are less than 880 square feet in the city right now. Yes, they're called non-conforming. Right, so I'm- The neighborhood I grew up, which is not too far from where you grew up, it's at the corner of Wilmot and Mott. There's a little wooden house that sits there. It doesn't fit in the neighborhood. Right, so but, but it was the first one built. Everybody else built after that. Now you're saying the house I grew up in can burn down. And if we change the ordinance the way we first requested to do it, somebody could come and put anything up that's 600 square feet on a piece of property that used to have 1,100 square foot ranch. That's not moving this city in a forward direction, if you ask me. All right, well, that, that is your opinion, Mr. Lubeck. The city council as a whole has decided to move forward with this. This is why Ms. Holman has put in the application with Habitat for Humanity. This is why we're having this public hearing right now. So I guess that is your opinion, and that is Just remember, part of this process. These are all voters. <laughs> I, I am very familiar. All right. I, <laughs> I have uh, two final points. I have two final points. Um, first, one of the city-owned properties is about 440 square feet. So it's already in our inventory. Uh, and um, the second is that we um, sadly have not been even able to give away the vacant lots that we have, much less have any interest in anybody building. We've, we've tried to give them to adjacent neighbors without success. We've tried to um, market these lots. Uh, nobody wants them. So the fact that we have somebody. 
So the fact that we have an interesting and unique project that's coming in that is going to offer home ownership and home ownership opportunity to someone that might otherwise just have be faced with rentals, um, I thought it was a very unique project to bring and, and fun project to bring to the city. Mr. Chair, I think in, in all fairness, we need to hold that public hearing. Yes, we do. I was just going to suggest to the uh, commission that we uh, let the public be heard. Uh, again, you're going to be limited to three minutes. State what your concerns are. Keep in mind, nothing has been decided here yet. And the final decision will be made by city council. Regardless of what we tell them, city council can do what they want, unfortunately. So, um, if this, I, let me make something perfectly clear. I am not completely opposed to this project. I think there might be a way that we can allow it. We can allow some different building methods in the city without completely gutting our standards. And that's where I'm looking at it from. If it were to go that way, a lot of specifics would have to come before the Planning Commission before anything could be built. But I said it earlier, and I don't think my commissioners are going to change their votes from last month, but they are absolutely opposed to gutting our standards to allow this. That being said, let's move to the hearing of the public. That gentleman was the first one I saw with his hand up, so I'll let him speak first. Mr. Lubick. Tom Gankus, and I really, really never thought I'd be speaking in public again after six years on the school board. Number one, whenever I was on the board and anything came before us with grant attached to it, it got a no vote from me because once you get through a grant, the grant, number one, isn't free. It's our money. It's taxpayer money. Government doesn't make money. It taxes for its money. When they say revenue, tax. Number two, I don't care how cool it is. I was born and spent the first 18 years of my life in a cute little house called the Parkside Housing Project. We had nine people in one of those houses. We had wall-to-wall -wall sisters in one bedroom. And when my wife and I got married, we stayed on the east side. I'll be 67 this year, and I've been living in East Point for 33 years in East Detroit, and I lived in Detroit for 33 years. We grew up on welfare. My dad worked three jobs. He worked for Ford and Chrysler and was laid off constantly because back in those days, that's what they did. And we are low income. We are blue collar. We weren't gutted in real estate. We were disemboweled. Nobody in Macomb County lost house value like we did. You want to build you want homeless vets? Fine. I just retired, and I'm talking with several people now, my wife and I, we want to see if we can't do something. We have over 1,500 units on a Selfridge Air National Guard base. Vets would love to live out there, and we're trying to see who we have to get in touch with to talk to them. And Mr. Jakubik, maybe I'll talk to you about it, because there are better things we can do. This is not anything against any one person. We have a beautiful neighborhood on my block. You've been there when you were running to get elected. We're a front porch neighborhood, just like the old east side. And we are neighbors. I don't have black neighbors, I don't have white neighbors. I have neighbors. If I have to delineate between them, then that makes me a racist, and I'm not. We're openly good neighbors in East Point, all of us. We mix in, we're diverse, we build our houses, and what bothers us it bothers me to hear a public official say they knew four houses were dilapidating year after year and they collapsed. Step in and do something because there's four beautiful houses on our block. Ranch houses, three bedrooms, full basements, $36,000, $38,000 dollars a family can move in there. God bless Habitat for Humanity. Buy that house. I'll come down there. I'm retired. I'll nail the hell out of it. 
I won't do a good job, but I'll be there. <laughs> but, you know, there are better ways to go about it. And to say it's a grant... 30 seconds. When I was on the school board, I always said, that's the foot in the door. That's the guy selling you the vacuum cleaner. Once they get in, you're done. I didn't want to sell Oakwood. We didn't bring it up again. I got off the board. They sold Oakwood. Boom, look what happened. We got a house. We got a project. We got everything else. Okay, fine. The city looks much better on that side of town. But I don't want, you know, what's cool is cool. That's fine. But what's practical is practical. Right. And I wouldn't nice. want my children, if I was a single parent, I would not want to live. Your time Last is thing, up. I'm a truck driver, retired. Mr. Don't let those things catch Mr. fire. Gankus, that's three minutes. Because it looks like a Could we get the residents time. to sign in? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, please sign the sheet on the podium when you're up here. And if I'm... <laughs> just look on it, do not allow Just want to clarify one thing, if I'm not, unless I'm mistaken about something here. The Ford Fund is providing this. It's not a government-funded grant in this instance. Let them put it into the lions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> you can go next. I'm sorry, I saw his hand up. Hi, I spoke earlier. Okay, that, if you would sign in again and also introduce you. That constant. And is there a way we can have the house lights brought back up? That concept two is right across the street from me. <laughs> I don't want that there. I've lost 50 grand on our house since we purchased it. And with that container house there, it's not going to look that way. That's a concept home. The lot is not big enough for what they're showing as far as this elaborate fancy. I will lose more money and point to the point of move out. You're not going to make any money off these container homes. All you're going to do is lose. You might as well pull a truck with a big box on the back of it and cut, take the wheels off it. I've been a builder a long time and I know exactly what it's going to look like. When you want to get a nice house, it's going to cost you $100,000. That's a low income end. When they're talking 400, 600 square foot, what are you going to put four kids in there? A mother and dad? It's not going to happen. The place is going to be run down just like the rest of them. And you know, I like East Point. We've been here for 16, 17 years. I moved from St. Clair Shores. They take care of their business. They did, why didn't they go to St. Clair Shores with the containers? Harper Woods is all burned out. Why didn't they go to Harper Woods? But they come here because it's nice. It's maintained. But it's not going to do us any good. A 400, 500 square foot house, 600. You know, I've built houses that have closets twice the size of those houses. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not exaggerating. I've had 1,000 square foot closets or bedrooms, 1,000 square foot bedrooms. And this is just not the right thing to do. Houses for humanity, I'll go along with that. At least it's a house. These are containers. And now he's not talking about a pitched roof. Something that sheds water. Trust 30, roof. 30 seconds, Mr. Brunka. Uh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm totally against it. And that concept number two, I broke down the door when it caught on fire. And I, it sat there for a year and a half. And Barb was a wonderful person, but she says, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. So, but uh, it, Mary and I took care of. That's three minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Owner. My name is uh, Lisa Got Me and my husband moved on Hay Street, so we're near Neal's, where that breaking lot is, where the house burned down. I just don't feel 
that's a good place for that. I mean, we all working. I'm no, I'm young. I ain't got a lot of years like these guys got. But me and my husband both work hard to maintain. We trying to maintain almost what it was a hundred thousand when we moved in and went down a little bit to eight. It's just, it just ain't for our place. It's just not for us. Take it to where y'all live at. Maybe fit it in where you go. But we working hard. We got good neighbors. We take care of our lawns. We take care. Of, we just, it's just good old working people. Just, just take it to four. I don't know what to tell you. Habitat has a big place in Detroit. My cousin has a habitat home. If you would speak into the microphone, please. Oh, oh. Well, my cousin has a home with humanity in Detroit. It's a beautiful home. It's a uh, three-story, what do you call them homes? It's real big, continental, sentinel. I don't know what you call it. But anyway, she got a nice home. But when she moved in the habitat area, they showed her this beautiful area of downtown Detroit they was going to make. They moved about 20 families in their low income. The neighborhood never went up. It went down. The house, drugs, it just, it just went. But she had a beautiful home, don't get me wrong. But it's just not for our area. I don't want to look on that corner of Neil's and see a, uh, what do you call those things you call them? Container. Yeah, container home. I don't want to see that. I really don't. And, I, and maybe it's because I work hard and I got a kid and I just, just a brick home. Just, I don't know, just take it somewhere else. It ain't for us. It really ain't. We got a, we got families and just good old people sit on their porch. I mean, now we got to worry about a container and all. It ain't for our neighborhood. Just take it, take it where you guys live. I don't know. It just, it just ain't for us. And I'm not against low income people. Do not get me wrong. I have worked hard all my life, and it's just if you want something good or a bigger home or want a better home, you work for it. You know, you just work for it. It's just, it's not, it's not for us. Not on Neil's, not on Hay Street. No, it's not. No, no, no. Ma'am, did you did you write your uh, sign? I did. And what was your name again, sir? Okay, thank you. M Mr. Chair, we'll need to have them direct their comments to the board and the commission rather than the audience. Okay. <laughs> sir. Gary Myron, East Point resident, and I do live on Hayes, down the street from one of these trailer parks. <laughs> Anyways, if you look at the picture of where it's going to be, look at the grass. Not edged, not cut. I get a lot of that, a lot of that in our neighborhood. I used to have that next door. It used to be a big pain. Got the landlord there, used to complain at her all the time. What is she going to do? You know, it's the guy working there. I got him across the street, talked to the landscape companies that cut the grass. They clean up after themselves now. Got people down the street. These houses, nobody talks about a garage or a shed. Where are they going to put the lawnmower? Where are they going to put the stuff for lawn? Keep up their house, trimming the bushes. Nothing's been said about that. So are they going to, yeah, they're going to match the neighborhood without cutting the grass. <laughs> That's the way I see it. And if Ford's is sponsoring this, there's a nice piece of property on Jefferson across the street from a Ford house. Why not there? I mean, that's a good spot for, a, you know, it's out of the way. I don't think anybody's really going to complain about it. And... Um, And I don't think, you know, the lowering the, the house, I mean, you can put skirt skirting on it. Trailer parts have skirtings on them. I mean, I just don't see how it's going to work here. I mean, I don't want to look at it. And the water bill, okay, there your house payments, five, five, six hundred bucks, add another 70 to 100. I'm one person. I pay $70, $70 for, you know, a unit. You know, that's 700 and something gallons, 400, yeah, 745. Well, you put two people, you're talking 70 to $100. More, you know, ask anybody. East Point has high water bills. And how are they going to afford that? 
A lot of renters can't afford it. That's why they don't pay it. It goes on the taxes. Well, that's all I have to say. <laughs> My name is Gloria Gorko, and I live on Furwood. Um, <clears throat> I live across the street from 22304, which was an 880-square-foot house like mine is. I'm on a 60-foot lot. And back in 2007, I could have got $100,000, give or take 10, for my home. I was going to move. I didn't. Economy fell. My house went down to a value of about $35,000 SCV. Uh, no, 19 SCV. It's just now getting up to um, 30. So <laughs> I've lost a lot of money, and I live there, and I support myself there. Now, that if I could sell my house at market value, say strictly double, that'd be $60,000. When I was working, I could have, <laughs> I don't know how to put it, you c I could not have afford a $75,000 or a $50,000 house. I couldn't do it now. That's why I'm where I'm at. But I've got 880 square feet in a full attic and a full basement. And I'm one person. And I kind of think, wow, with one bathroom, you know, two people would really have to do a lot of shuffling. I mean, it is small in a sense. And if you think you're going to put, this is not a family town if you think you're going to put people in a 484 or 434 square foot $75,000. No, that'd be the $50,000. You got a break, 400 square feet for 50,000, or you get a whole 600 square feet for 75,000. Well, you could buy my house for probably 65 and have 880. <laughs> so you can't tell me that this is gonna raise the property values. And I think of things like the gentleman said before me, where's the closet? Where do they, what if they want a one-car garage, which I do have now? Would they build it a metal, or would they build it a brick, or would they build it of wood? What about a shed? What about closets? What about a laundry room? Or are they gonna have to go to the laundromat all the time? <coughs> a drop-down table for your dining room? I mean, this is good for maybe a one-person I mean, some tiny homes are only 400 square feet, three to 400 square feet, the tiny homes. And at the most, <laughs> it's two people and they absolutely minimalize. 30 I've seconds, Miss Gordo. Because I've seen it. I've seen it on HGTV, the amazing way they live with nothing, just the bare, bare essentials. So I'm totally not in favor of this, and I hope that the city council doesn't sweep us off our feet and say, well, you don't have any say on 880 square feet. I think the planning commission, if they decide that's what it should be, then that's what it should be. Thank you. Ma'am? Yes. Hello, my name is Jennifer Woodward, and um, I lived in the city of East Point my entire life. Um, my parents have been here for a long time. They have a large, beautiful home that sits on seven stately lots on um, Stevens at Grove. It's gorgeous. I can't imagine next to that house if there were an empty lot and we decided to put a container home there. Um, for anyone who lives near that, you know the ramifications of that decision won't be seen until five to ten years down the road when people are trying to sell their homes, can't get their sale price, and then that house starts the trickle-down effect because everyone else's home around it is affected by that. So I watched my home value drop 60% of its worth during the debacle of the arm loan scandal in 2008. Those homes have slowly crept back and this city is finally starting 
to see a little bit of revitalization. What we don't need to do is to risk it all on an idea like that. And first of all, I think the most telling thing are the people that live right by it. They don't want to see that. They don't want to look out their door, and they're the ones that are going to live by that. That's going to directly affect them, and then come time, directly affect me, directly affect my parents, directly affect you. You'll see that, but it won't be immediate, just like the arm loan scandal wasn't immediate. That came I mean, everybody fell for that. Everybody fell for those, we're going to give you great loan prices, adjustable rate loan. GMAC was our friend. Do you know they hid after that debacle? They hid, and they had to change their name so they could come back as something you would trust. They became Ally Mortgage. Okay? GMAC knew what they did. Then right on top of that, the heels of that, we had the auto industry. We lost Colonial Dodge. This whole city took a nosedive. Wall Street, it was, this was all at the same time. All of this happened. This city has fought a hard road to come back. Our home values are starting to come back. It's a family town. We have open choice so we can fill our schools. Let's make it a family town, fill it that way. Gentleman in the back there. Uh, hello, my name is Robert Carsley. I also live on Hayes. Um, the first hour here we spent talking about masonry walls and how you've talked favorably about having a one continuous masonry wall rather than having it broken up with chain link and, and uh, old wood houses. And now we're talking about putting houses made out of shipping containers in the neighborhood. There, there's a consistency there that I think we're missing. Um, I don't care what the value of my house is. I'm not going anywhere. I, I love my neighborhood. I love my house. I hope it does go down so I don't have to pay taxes. But the, the, the 50 and 75,000 you're talking about, houses can be bought in this city for that price. Good houses made in the 40s and 50s, quality houses. For 75, you can buy a house here. And I'm not exaggerating. I think you're exaggerating with the 50 and 75. When you say 50, please address. When you say fit, when they say 50, that means 75. And when they say 75, that's 100. You, you, this isn't going to be made for $50,000. But you can buy one for $50,000. So what do we talk? What's, what's the point here? I, it's hard to argue against something that I don't quite understand. I don't see the driving point here. What, what wrong are they writing? What, what good is this doing? Uh, like you say, we're going to shove veterans into these, into these things? Um, but I, uh, I read the Macomb Daily, too, and I thought, it's a done deal. Well, I guess it's not, but now I'm told that we don't have any decision here, that you guys are city commissioners, not, this isn't the city council. Um, it's a done deal, according to them. So I, I, I don't know what we're doing. Do we have any choice here at all? And just for clarification, this isn't a question and answer period. This is an opportunity for you to speak your mind. They were rhetorical. I was just letting everybody else know. Mr. Creech. Thank you, Harvey Creech, resident of East Point. There's been so much brought to mind at this meeting. I'm glad to see these people. You know, when they say wake up and smell the roses, you know, the roses are here, but how do you wake up? If the city council can do as they may, presentable to this, that's what I said. I'm on the Board of Appeals, but I'm only one person. And the same thing about it. Excuse me, all these people here, they're sitting in the audience, 
plus this board up there commission has the same difference about it. We can venture to say what we want, when we want, how we want, but it comes right down to the satisfaction of the city council. And this is exactly, the people out here, you're saying this because the same thing. The last gentleman come up said, he, he just put it in plain terms. Excuse me for saying this, you can't put perfume on a pig. If, if we're down to the point of where we need to come up, let's come up, but let's don't, let's don't drag it up. Let's pick it up. Leave those houses out there right now and those vacant lots until we can do something with them. Is that, you know, we had a, excuse me, Senator, I don't know if she was commissioner. I, I think, I thought I used to know all the people in the city, but apparently I don't. And, and, and she come up and said, this is what's going to happen? We can't even give those lots away? Excuse me for saying this. Did anybody come up to you and ask if you won the lot? No. no. I mean, I, I, I didn't hear a yes. Not one. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to discredit anybody because I hold office in this city. I've got 52 years invested in this city. I want to live in this city. I watched my house go down. I had a $125,000 house at one time. I don't know what it would bring on the open market now. But everybody up here, I love what this commission has got to say today, and especially, as I say, I come down here to back them up 100%. And I hope the rest of you residents, you've done, a, you've done a heck of a job, because right now, I want to see this city. My wife finally said she's had enough. She wants to leave. My house is paid for. And I said the same difference about it. You know, I'm, I'm 72 years old. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to fight for the residents. I want to fight for the people. I want to fight for this city, and let's keep it alive. Let's bring it back up to the standards of what we need. Let's don't bring it down. Let's bring it up. Thank you. I just want to clarify one thing again. We asked neighbors about the empty lots, not the entire city. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think it crossed the street. Mr. DeMonico, this is a public hearing. That means the entire public gets to be heard. Okay. Lady in the red sweater. Hi, my name is Joni Amarmino, and I've been a resident for 37 years, and my house is paid off, and, um, but... The questions I have, or the concern I have, of no one actually talked about um, the economic remaining life of these container homes. How long are they going to last? You know, they're not. You know, they're not built of you know uh, brick, and you know, will they rust out? What? How will they be looking in our neighborhood? So I'm I'm against having a container home. I. Well, unless it was 1,200 square feet, but um, you know, to have something small like this just doesn't make sense for our community. Like we said, our values of our homes went down, and now they're starting to go back up. And you know, I'm all for putting anybody into a home. Um, when it comes to the veterans, if it's a d disabled vet. Um, you know, who's going to go into this home? If it's a disabled vet, they're exempt from paying property taxes. So we won't be getting that <coughs> tax revenue. So, um, and I know one of the homes has to have a vet, according to the Habitat for Humanity. Um, the other um, con um, concern I have is, how are these unique homes going to get mortgages? What mortgage company is even gonna give them a mortgage on this type of a property? I work for a mortgage company, and there isn't anyone out there unless Ford Foundation's going to give them the financing. I don't know, but um, there's no comparables in our community if that house did want to sell either. So um, obviously, you're not going to put a container home against a brick home. Um, so uh, besides that, I am against um, lowering our standards. Um, I appreciate all the Planning Commission that you're all against lowering our standards for our minimum property um, housing, but um, 
as I feel too, that this seems like it's already an, a done deal. And if that's how the city council's going to, to present it, since it does sound like they put together a nice little proposal and wanted this, fine, uh, this type of a home, then we'll have to remember that on election day. Thank you. Gentleman in the green shirt. Good evening, Gary Sasek, 68 year resident of East Point. Um, I can't believe I'm playing a devil's advocate tonight. Innovation and change is always very difficult to ex accept a lot of times. Um, there's a definite need. There's a way to process this need. Ford has spent a lot of hours coming up with a plan this commission is spending a lot of hours trying to debate things. I think there's some options. I've lived here, like I said, 68 years. I am the oldest of six children. Eight of us grew up in a two bedroom, no basement, no garage, 900 square foot house on Wilmot and East Point. I still live here because I've loved this city. I'm active in this city. I think you have some options as a commission where you can embrace some of this innovation without lowering our standards. And I think the public really needs to be made more aware that there are some options there where we can try this and allow somebody to come in. Again, I'm not saying four people should be in a six or 400 square foot house either because I know the hell it was for eight of us growing up in that house. But change is difficult to accept, but I think we have to look at it, and I think we have to try to move forward, and I think you have some options that would not lower our standards. Thank you. Over here on the end, yes. My name is Judy Trubiano. I am new to East Point. I live on Hayes. Hi, neighbors. Um, I also, from my front porch, I can see the uh, uh, lot that, that is being considered for one of these houses. I, don't, I, I moved into this neighborhood to be in a neighborhood, not a trailer park. And <laughs> also, I am a realtor, and 100% of my clients are all veterans. I don't think any of them would move into one of these. Uh, and also the fact that what this other woman brought up about the um, mortgages. Mortgage companies aren't going to finance these. When these people move out, <laughs> it, 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 they won't get financing. Um, and again, I've heard, like I said, I'm new to the neighborhood, and I've heard that East Point is a family-oriented city. Um, it, okay, we had a person there who grew up a lot, a lot big family, small house. That, that's not today's world. It, it doesn't fit. Um, I don't see a family moving into one of these. And if we do have a disabled veteran, how are they going to get around in a 400 square foot unit? Odds are it's going to be real difficult. So I, I, just, I strongly disagree with uh, moving these in. I'm, I'm good for change. I'm open. Change is hard, I agree. But if it's good, it's easier to do. Uh, if it's bad, we're going to all go down crying. I, I don't agree that this is a good thing to do. Habitat has a minimum credit score as part of their application process regarding the mortgages. Mr. DeMonaco, this is a hearing, uh, a public hearing. This is not a question and answer response period. Good evening, Planning Commission. Uh, Mary Hall Rayford, East Point. I have a couple of concerns. One expressed to me by a coworker who could not be here tonight. 
Um, they're adamantly opposed to the container homes um, for a number of reasons. And as yet, I haven't heard a good enough excuse to lower the standards. And one of the reasons I have a problem with that is because there are rumors floating, and I'm one of those people that um, are constantly on Facebook making statements. I am not ashamed of that. I'm going to be here supporting the residents until I die. And if people have a problem with that, oh well. My concern is that if we lower the standards now, what will stop the tiny homes from moving into East Point? And people don't want that. I know for a fact that there are people who do. But I don't think those people care about this family town the way most of the people who live here do. So I would urge you to, you know, I realize the council has the final say in what happens. But council needs to be more responsive to the residents. This is about the residents. Council members are supposed to be representing what the residents want, not what any one or two individuals want. And I believe with everything in me, when we take that position, everyone will work harder and together to make sure this remains a family town that everyone will be proud of. My name is Shelly Crook, and I have lived here for 30 years. And I'm sorry if the council has already decided their decision on this, then why are we even here? This is a called a planning commission meeting where we all get a, a, a voice. And it doesn't seem like our city council is giving the residents the due voice that we deserve, especially if you're telling us that they have already decided. I feel that our city council is strong arming us residents to get what they want. And I don't feel that that is appropriate. We are the residents, we pay our taxes. You, they work for us. Hi, my name is Angela Carrier, and I am a resident of East Point on Hayes. And I was not notified of the storage container possible thing until one of my other neighbors clued me in. Then I started researching. Um, but I'm on the other side of Hayes than they are, and I butt up against Grafton property and the Oakwood Senior Center. And when they built Grafton, first of all, there was a lot of digging right up against my uh, privacy fence and parts of it were broke. And then they tore down the cyclone fence that was behind me and put up a masonry wall halfway through my property. And that's just one problem I've had with them. So I'm wondering what kind of problems I might have with the container home being on my street since I've already had problems with other projects that the city has gone through with. And my house, actually, I've only been here for about seven years. I purchased my house for under $18,000, and I put in a kitchen, a fire, a furnace, a furnace, pipes, and water heater because none of that stuff was in my house when I bought it. So I have made it work with a very low, you know, priced house. And I think if you have a lot of homes in here that are vacant, which mine was for over two years, that they can be rehabbed too. And I'm a single mom with a disabled child and I make minimum wage and work four jobs. I can do it. There are families out there who can do it too. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak this evening? 
Anyone else wishing to speak this evening? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and move on or back to new business item A. Ms. Van Heron. Oh, Chairman Lubeck, may I ask that we take a 10 minute recess? I have no problem with that. We will take a 10 minute recess. Someone else is talking. <laughs> I guess you were. <laughs> a few season. No. You know, I, st I still. Uh, this is really contentious. I know. I'm this evening. No, I, I asked the, the gentleman over there to last. Turn your microphone on, please. Yeah, I, I asked this gentleman over here uh, a few questions that I had reg regarding the interior, but I'm, I'm good. Okay, then. New item. New business, item A, Ms. Van Aaron. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, proposed changes to three sections of the ordinance to accommodate un unique home construction, including container homes. Section 50-70B, regarding the minimum floor area. Currently requires a minimum home size of 880 square feet. The change would reduce the requirement to 660 square feet. Changes to section 50-151A12, schedule of regulations, changing the minimum home size. Changes to section 50-169, exterior building and wall materials, would allow for the flexibility of exterior building materials and construction standards to comply with Michigan building codes. And, and as you indicated, Mr. Chair, um, or somebody did that, Earlier today, I had um, emailed to the commissioners and then provided hard copies to you tonight. Um, some other alternatives within those sections that might address these changes as special land use and or PUD um, de development. And so I think it would still affect those three sections of the ordinance, which is what our public hearing was um, advertised for and published for. Um, and so we could discuss, you know, um, those sections or those recommended ordinance changes also. Okay, I know we approached this issue last month and we took a vote on the issue. And uh, just gonna ask the commissioners, is there anyone that wishes to change their vote on that? No. Nope. From last month? Not me. Okay, so no one is in favor of changing our standards. Has everyone had an opportunity to review the email that Ms. Van Heron sent earlier today? No. I didn't go on, uh, on a computer today. Okay, well, uh, so I'd be happy to, to go through that briefly if you'd like. Yes, if you would. Yeah. Um, so the, the same ordinance sections that I just read off that I, and, and I was the one who initially came up with the ordinance sections that I thought would need modification in order to be able to construct. And I only looked at the, the first model that he was, um, that they were suggesting tonight. And I came up with 660 square feet. So my calculations were a little different than, than theirs, but they didn't provide us with that information. So I kind of took it at face value, did some measurements on, on, a, on a sketch and came up with those sections of the ordinance that would need to be changed. Um, in further review of that, and I think it was Mr. Lubick who thought that perhaps we could look at doing this under a special land use and or a PUD, uh, planned unit development, and, um, and perhaps we can, that can still be you know, discussed. If that's the case, then we could look at not modifying those zoning ordinance sections to the extent where we would dictate or, or reduce the size of the home and reduce the finished materials or modify the finished materials, but rather look at them on an individual per case basis and so that the planning commission 
would have an opportunity if indeed it were approved through an as a special land use approval to, to look at the particulars of each um, um, property and then make recommendation to the um, city council with those um, standards that they would recommend um, up allowing if, if they would consider it in, in those individual cases. So that's what this other handout provided, those more minimal changes to the ordinance that would just add the language basically if it doesn't meet those standards of square footage that an SL, a special land use approval could be um, requested. Well, I know I was shocked Tuesday night when I was at the council meeting. Uh, what limited information we had last month was certainly different than the information they presented Tuesday evening. And, and Especially when they said, concept two, 400 square feet. And I didn't know about that previous or I you know wouldn't have suggested 660 square feet so it's, it's kind of a evolving um, plan and, and yeah but it's clear from last month and also tonight that we're not going to change the minimum standards so I guess what we are having a discussion on then tonight if the Planning Commission so desires is do we want to look at an alternate method that may allow us to consider smaller houses of unique design and materials. You know, I think once you do that, you're opening a Pandora's box, okay? Because somebody's going to come along, well, you did it for this group. Why can't you do it for our group? This is the problem that I have with that. The standard is the standard. You just leave it alone. That's why I voted no before and I'm voting no now. Miss Haw or Mr. Albright, would you want to comment on that? Does that put us on the slippery slope just because we might approve one in one area that we would have to approve all in all areas if it was a special land use or a planned unit development. I don't think it would cause a slippery slope because each property would look, be looked at individually. I don't think that would drag us into a lawsuit. I've got a point of inquiry. I think so. How does the special land use uh, work? like? Do we pick up, like, which properties, do we need to designate which properties, uh, or? So, so the special land use works, uh, uh, somebody who wants to construct a home on any particular property, and they've been used for, um, generally, commercial properties, comes forth with their, with their plans, and, and the ordinance sets forth that, you know, certain business types would be requiring a special land use versus just um, a site plan review, and they come before the, Planning Commission, who considers all the, you know, the location of the property, um, you know, what's adjacent to it, how it will impact the neighborhood, how it will impact traffic to the site, you know, all the different considerations that then our planning consultants really pull all that together and then make recommendation based on, on those specifics of that property. I didn't know in initially looking at this and, and asked our planner to, to give their opinion on it if a special land use would be appropriate for a single family in the R1 zoning district. It's not a different land use, it's, but maybe it's special just by nature of it being a special kind of home. So I'm not certain about that, and, and um, Ms. Haw can give her um, thoughts on that. Or if, if a PUD would be an appropriate means for approving such a um, type of home if that was of interest to the Planning Commission and City Council. Based on the city's existing ordinance, the language um, in the PD plan development option section already lends itself to more of that innovative um, use of a property rather than a special land use. And currently, a permitted use in the PD district is a single family dwelling. So the foundation is already there. Um, 
if the city was interested in a tax amendment just for PDs. There is an article in your um, packet this evening with um, an excerpt from the American Planning Association's journal um, with a case study from Missouri. And the planning director there um, is quoted saying, they were approached with um, container homes in 2017, the city was, and um, they revised their ordinances <coughs> for a conditional use, which um, would be similar to the PD process. But he states, the conditional use process gives the planning commission and city council more options to place appropriate conditions on a project. It notifies neighbors and gives them a say in the process. We recognize this is a trend in the country. We may have more individuals who want this kind of home. The ordinance allows us to say, before you go forward, we want you to do a few things to protect the city. So a process like this, as opposed to just a straight rezoning or amendment to the ordinance that would affect all residential properties, is if it was a PD, um, then you would be utilizing a process that involves the neighbors, um, provides that notification to the public, and requires both review of the Planning Commission and the City Council. Um, so there's multiple steps with a PD um, for, for that review and to make sure that the project is compliant with um, with the site that's proposed and the surrounding uses. What community was that in Missouri? St. Charles. St. Charles. It's a St. Louis suburb. What was the difference between then? So like there's container homes in Royal Oak and Ferndale, and I think someone said that no ordinances needed to change. Obviously, the square foot wouldn't apply to the ones that were mentioned, but what about the um, the, out, the exterior materials? Does anybody have any idea? Both um, Mr. Albright and I tried to find um, ordinances that were approved in Birmingham, Royal Oak, and Ferndale, and we were unsuccessful um, at finding anything on the books. So it's likely that they may have went through uh, a PD process themselves where each project was evaluated specifically on its own merits. And by doing so, and if the Planning Commission clearly states its rationale and findings, as well as the City Council, for that specific project, it does protect you from future, from creating precedent for future projects. Let me ask a question. If someone came to the city, was willing to put a brick facade and 900 square feet in the form of a container house, would it be permitted in East Point? Sure, as long as it met building code requirements. Sure. So there's nothing that prevents anybody from building a container house in East Point as long as it meets our minimum standards. Th that's right. And building code requirements, naturally. So all we're really discussing here is a possibility of how small can it be and what kind of material can be put on the outside of it. And the roof pitch is a, is a thing too. Our ordinance is um, set forth that houses shall be of a similar um, nature and design both in the roof um, and the exterior building materials as those in the um, surrounding area. They said that there was one of these homes built in Benton Harbor. Can we get some information on what Benton Harbor did? Do we have any information readily accessible? No, not this evening. That was the first that we've heard of the Benton Harbor example. 
I mean, we we looked at an image of it on well, they mentioned it, and quite frankly, it looks horrible in my opinion. Uh, just a big old container with a door in it. The gr the grounds around it look decent, but I think we really need to to see that language. Uh, how did they handle it? Did they drop their ordinances to allow this to happen? So, you know, it would be nice to have some factual data versus, well, we could do this or we could do that, and it might look like this and it might look like that. And it would also be nice to see what kind of real estate values are going on around it. You know, Benton Harbor has been decimated financially just like we had been real estate-wise. Um, so maybe it would be nice to see if we can get some data. You know, what are the real estate values around those properties doing? Before we even go any further in talking about a special land use or a, P, a, a PD potential, we have one example in the state of Michigan. Why not data mine and use that? It's a fair point. Um, and it's not a fair comparison, but as a point of reference, in Ferndale, I looked at three different container houses. And again, it's, it's not apples to apples. The locations in Ferndale are going for about $205 a square foot. These items that they were presenting were at 125 and the average house, and I don't really know the average house, but for my sampling of the houses right around the areas that would be impacted, it was about $75 a square foot. As low as 65 up to 85 So there's a range, but the, 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 the um, container houses in Ferndale are beautiful, but they're not, the, the premise of what was today was low-income housing, <laughs> right? So, so the ones in Ferndale are just, they're, they're beautiful, but they're way above the, the market. So like the streets that they're on, they are one and a half to two and a half times the neighbor's house but they're also bigger, they're newer, you know, so the comparison just isn't there. And I understand your point, let's find some comparables. And I don't think we're gonna find a lot of great comparables, but it's a good point. Do you have the streets those are on in Ferndale? I do. Camden, Inman, and another one, I don't know. You don't know what the other one is? I could find it. Because I'm familiar with one that's on Browning in Ferndale, and uh, okay, Arts in the Eye of the Beholder and Beautiful just doesn't strike me as that one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, this, this has to, even if Benton Harbor is the only one in Michigan, there have to be other ones around the country somewhere. They, I mean, Ford just couldn't have randomly plucked it out of the air and said, we're going to create something brand new that's nationwide and brand new for East Point. There's got to be something that we can use as a benchmark. There has to be. I, you know, I, I think I, I can't speak for anybody else here but myself, and I think we've all been pretty consistent. We're not going to drop our standards for this, so now we're forced to look at a special land use or, or a PD development. So if we're going to look at a land use and, or a special land use or a PD development, then I need more information. And I need factual data, not pie in the sky, this might be this and that might be that. If, if St. Charles, Missouri has some of these container homes, and I was just looking at them, and I don't normally do this while, during a meeting, but I was looking at some of the images of container homes in St. Charles, they don't look low income. And I have a good friend that lives in St. Charles, Missouri, and it's not low-income town. So if the target is people that are below a certain level of wealth or income, then I need to see a comparable property somewhere. Somewhere. Don't, don't give me an estimation. And I, quite frankly, am not prepared to vote on anything until I have some concrete data. I couldn't hear that gentleman. I, I, I asked him what kind of insulation they were going to use on the building because during the winter they're going to be cold, during the summer they're going to be hot. I'm sure they're absolutely brilliant at what they're going to do. And I, I, every one of them was very impressive. And they're all very passionate about what they're doing. And I completely respect it. I just need, personally, and I'm sure technologically they'll be a wonder. And they'll be financially efficient and all this great stuff. I just need to see data. See, they're well, using, 
they're using the nine, nine foot six inches so they can put a ceiling in there to drag the heating and everything else up there. But if you take an eight foot six, you ain't gonna do that. Mr. Lubeck, I think I have Mr. Broll's. The, the third one is at the corner of Lewiston and Gainsborough, according yep. to this article. Okay. For the third one. Could be, yeah. Well, I think the situation we're faced here is this is a new project, this is a new concept, this is a new market target. So I don't think we're going to get the kind of information you're looking for because they haven't done it before. I just want to know why the city is really pushing this thing. I mean, what, what is this all about, really? Why do we have to have container houses in this city? Why is it a must? You know, do you want, I think, uh, do you want me to talk, uh, Walt, about, about that? Um, so, well, first of all, we're get, this is a grant from the Ford Fund, and they, they said as part of it they have to work with a nonprofit. So I guess one question as I'm listening here is, say that this wasn't low-income housing, the reason it is is because we're working with Habitat for Humanity. They don't build homes for people that can afford them, you know, on, you know, without Habitat. So if that wasn't the case, and then actually a point that I'm not sure if it was a point, Mr. Bro, if you're trying to make, but these homes are actually worth more per square foot than other homes. And actually, both of these styles are costing more than what I bought my home for in East Point. I bought my home for $45,000 in East Point. Obviously, that was a few years ago, closer to the recession. But does if this wasn't low, you know, if two low-income families weren't moving in, I guess I'd be interested in knowing what everyone's thoughts are. And if they're nice-looking or maybe... You know, Mr. Lubeck asked a question about if it was completely brick around the shipping container, it sounds like that would be all right, I guess, because then you don't know at that point. That's what you were saying, Ms. Van Heeren, right? About uh, Well, then, yeah, then, then I don't know that we would have any ability to deny it. Um, or if it was aluminum siding, let's face it, that's an acceptable building material. Now they use vinyl. Um, or a wood siding, those are all acceptable building materials. So... It's just the fact that it's got the container showing on the outside. I mean, if that steel was going horizontal instead of vertical, everyone would think it was fine. So, Mr. Jakubiak, I guess for me, I'm not going to talk on everyone. Else. You know, I don't know the rest of city council's exact personal reasons. But for me, you know, it's an exciting project. You know, it sounds exciting initially, and then I look into it. And, you know, we're helping a couple families. You know, Habitat's in here, Ford Fund's throwing in money, grant money. Um, and yeah, and of course, so anything like new, like we're talking about here, there's going to be some amount of risk to everything. I mean, did like, you know, when Google started their search engine, I don't think there really were any search engines, you know, but they said, Hey, let's go make one, you know, like you, you just gotta, you know, to me, I'm just trying to think, you know, we're trying to just build, you know, two homes for. Uh, for some folks in the neighborhood. And I, of course, want them to look nice, too. I mean, I, I don't want them to not look nice or not fit in with the neighborhood. So at least that's that's been my thoughts so far. Of course, I'm, you know, learning more as, you know, Ford Fund showing us more information. And, you know, and also part of this is we are going through this whole process right now. It's not, um, I think a few people used a done deal there's a lot of steps to this. We put in an application, and Habitat has now selected ours and is working with us, but we have these other steps, and Planning Commission always, no matter any projects like this, everything goes through Planning Commission, and it's always up to City Council to accept or deny the Planning Commission's recommendation. So it's the same process that's used for everything else. City Council always has the you know like last vote, I guess, if that's what you're saying. So the, there hasn't been a final say yet. That vote hasn't taken, you know, taken place yet. Let me back up 
from a few moments ago and asked Ms. Van Heron, could you build a house and put T111 siding on it? Could I? In East Point. Is that permissible? Certainly. Well, that's vertical, not horizontal, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you could do it. Yeah, I was going to ask, what, what, did you, what is it called? T111. T111 I knew Ms. Van Heron yeah. would know what it was. It's, yeah. it's not that popular anymore. It's not. It requires maintenance. Yeah. You got to stain it or paint it every now and then, so it's you know not very desirable. And it's not not very friendly to work with. No, no. It, it's think of it as really aggressive outdoor paneling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's probably the easiest way to try to describe it. <coughs> Wood stucco with ridges. Okay. <laughs> well, siding became our friend. So. Uh, well, I mean, I'm just throwing that out there that if it's aluminum on the outside of the building, it's permissible. Yes. Not steel. <laughs> well, so I guess that's a good question because is the part that's, uh, uh, that we're looking at, it says um, what a residential dwelling, dwelling building shall be provided with roof designs, roofing materials, exterior finish materials including doors and windows that are like or directly similar to that found on a majority of the residential dwelling buildings in the surrounding area okay well now i'm going to ask you another question miss van here does that mean when i replace my roof i can't put a steel roof on my house well according to the ordinance um it would have to be similar material and yet we do have a couple of steel roofs in in town um, and I don't think it was even thought about when someone asked for um, a permit to put a, a metal roof on their house. No one even thought, gee, that's not asphalt shingle. We shouldn't allow it. We just we issued permits, and, and they put them on, and they look great. And they cost a lot of money. And you know, um, So it's just as building materials innovate and, and, and become you know, either popular to use or, or, or more affordable to use, um, you know, things change. And, and so our ordinances... That's why I never looked at it as a downgrading of our ordinances, but just a, you know updating of them or changing them or, or you know modifying them. Um, same thing to me with the small smaller footprint. Some people don't want a big house, and maybe 1,200 square feet is just not necessary for them. You know, a lot of people would live just fine in a 600 square foot house as they live just fine in a 600 square foot apartment. So. I, I never looked at these as being I, uh, downgrading our ordinances. I never. I, I guess I'm looking at the late '80s and '90s, where you had a three-bedroom, one-bathroom house in East Point, and you raised anywhere from two to ten kids in it. And everything was fine. Yeah. And then at that point in time, suddenly, each kid had to have its own bedroom. Yeah. Your garage had to be 1,000 square feet, and the house better not be less than 2,400 square feet. Can so you say northern Macomb County? Yeah. Everything old is new again, right? I mean, so now what was acceptable back in the 70s, you know, yeah, where you raise a, uh, you know, a family of eight in an 800-square-foot house, you know. Now you're putting a family of two in a 600-square-foot house. It's, it's, maybe it's becoming, you know, back That two-story, that tri-level that was so attractive when you were young and had kids— doesn't quite nearly look as attractive when you're approaching retirement. You've got bad knees. That's right. <laughs> so. <sighs> Any other questions or discussion? Uh, if these people are, um, and I'm assuming low income, Who's going to cut the grass and who's going to get rid of the snow? We've got to have a lawnmower. Well, one of the ordinance provisions that I had thought that should be included was as our ordinance now require um, a certain area for storage, certain square footage, and, and I was tacking on a provision that storage areas can be contained within an accessory structure because practically speaking, you will need to be able to have an area to keep that lawnmower. Maybe it's just a push mower, you know, the old-fashioned kind without a motor. Um, <laughs> but you need somewhere to put it, and we don't want it out on. Yeah, your front but wall. isn't that going to leave an empty spot in the ceiling of Cracker Barrel? <laughs> oh, is that where they have them now? Yeah, but I I do think that that would have to be um, included to have a shed of some size to hold your shovel and your lawnmower. 
I don't know if that's required, though. I mean, some people have people cut their grass for them. They sure. Don't, they don't need a lawnmower. You're right. And I can put a shovel in a small spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's well, well, these small. people have that money. That's the problem. Well, what if their brother does it for them? <coughs> he lives in East Point. I mean, they you don't need a shot. You're never going back. But isn't it irrelevant to even talk about who's going to be living in there? Because nobody knows who's going to be there, whether it's a vet, whether it's going to be low income. All we know is those people will be selected by habitat. What needs to be accomplished with what we're discussing now is we need to have, if it's going to happen in a PUD or a special land use, it needs to be harmonious with the neighborhood. So ultimately, if we're going to lose this, and it's going to go to a PUD or, or whatever, the properties need to be harmonious with the dwellings around it. Masonry veneer, stone veneer, whatever the case may be, if this is going to happen, it needs to blend with the community. It should not stick out like a sore thumb. And as much as I like those lovely wood pergolas, and that's the name of what the man was looking for the other day, they're very nice in backyards, and they might be very nice in the front yard, and I like the skylights, very fresh, but it needs to have a stone or brick veneer to match the community around it. And the yard needs to be maintained. Not that you can ever manage that, because very few people maintain their yards the way that a lot of us would like them to. But there are areas in this city where there are no brick houses on a street so you can't say it has to have a brick exterior true but it shouldn't be harmonious because those homes that you're speaking of that i'm thinking of initially are some of the cinder block homes on almond i believe and maybe teppert uh certainly not the most there are a lot of sided homes in the city well i'm i'm thinking about the cinder block homes they're not exactly the most um attractive forgive me if anybody in here has one um but it seems to me that whatever the, the facade of the homes around it, it should blend in. So if it's cinder block homes in that area, then why couldn't it have a cinder block veneer? If it's uh, sided homes over there, it should have sided veneer. It just, it needs, whatever happens, it needs to fit in the community. And isn't that pretty much what this is all about? Is we want the people to fit into the community. I don't care how much money they make. I don't care about, you know, ultimately, I really don't care about the size. I care about how it's going to fit in our community. How is the home going to look on the property? I would prefer it to be 880 square feet, but if this is going to happen, it needs to blend in. So if somebody drives past that home, they don't know that it was a Hanjin container that came across from Korea five years ago. Now that's why last last month I brought up all of this should be done in a subdivision where all the houses in that area are going to look pretty much the same. But when you plunk them down in the middle of our neighborhood and all the houses are brick and they're all look they all look pretty much the same, it's going to stand out. And I, that's why I think a lot of these people are upset. We want our neighborhoods to look the same. If you're in a frame neighborhood, then all the houses should be frame. If you're in a brick neighborhood, all the houses should be brick. That's very old fashioned. Well, <laughs> I'm 76 I, I, years old. I know, I, I, okay. yeah, I, I'm, no, I'm not young myself, but I mean, that's I really don't want to <laughs> say take it to that point. Many years ago, there was a school called Roxana Park Elementary School. It was no longer needed. They tore it down on the section of the land where the school sat. They built houses. The north part is now actually a park called Roxana Park. There's actually something there now. If you drive down and look at the houses they built, they are all identical except for the front facade. You have A, B, C, and D. When you say match the neighborhood, I don't want to see neighborhoods built like that. 
You can drive to other sections of the city and you can see almost every imaginable design and material houses. Which makes East Point kind of unique. We've got a whole half mile section of one street that's duplexes. And pretty much when they were built, you probably couldn't tell one from the other. It's only through landscaping and awnings and stuff that over the years now, they've become a little more individual. I'm looking at this as a PUD, and I guess I'm going to ask the question. Why would we not allow something different in terms of a duplex in the city? Other than thinking of the zoning map, there's only the one area where it's allowed. I don't know why we wouldn't. Uh, last month, uh, Commissioner Palazzola asked the question, what about an apartment complex created out of containers? Is he building it? <laughs> why not, yeah. I think there's one going up in Royal Oak. It, it's an interesting question. So based on what we've heard tonight, there's nothing that prevents somebody from building a container home in the city as long as the exterior materials are matching the neighborhood, the roof line matches those similar to the neighborhood, and that it's 880 square feet or larger. So if that's true, then what you're saying is every container house will have to either be brick, cinder block, or vinyl siding, or, or aluminum siding. Is that what, is that what we, this is not the point of a container house. A container house is not to match the brick houses down the street. It's a hip, cool thing. That doesn't mean I'm a favorite. I didn't, I don't want, 600 square foot container houses but there's a pl there's a time and place and container houses are coming whether we like it or not but but it's part of our role though let's understand what a container house is who wants a container house if we're going to craft a policy we need to understand that just go and go and look you know google container houses and you'll see that's what a 20 year old might want that house he doesn't want a container house with bricks built around it that's not what a, the point of a container house is so it's, it's something that should be different. The question is whether we want that in our neighborhood, but it, don't hem us in to, to have, putting cinder blocks around a container house as not the point of a container house. It's, it's something that somebody, it's a, it's a reflection of how they are and where, where they want to live, and it's a new trend, you know? So, so let me ask a question. Would you be in favor of container project that is larger or at our minimum or larger <coughs> i would be in favor of a container project that exceeds that is tasteful again i w i was really impressed with the houses i saw in ferndale and again i understand though it's not parallel the issue with the container houses that we saw today is they look like a container which does some people would want that i understand we as a, a board probably are not looking that way but there are people that's what they want to do Maybe a 20 year old wants that. The, um, well, I don't know. What, what is that? I don't know. Um, there, there's a place for it, is I guess my point. But there's that, a place. But that 20 year old that's wanting a hip, cool place is not necessarily somebody who's making $18,000 a year. You're talking about the. That's why, whatever we're, the, that's why we're moving past the discussion about a 600 square foot house. I, I don't think anybody has the palette for that. No. And, and their whole point, the presentation today was all cost base, mm -hmm. right? That's that's why there's no siding on the outside. Because if they add the siding, now that person that, that can't afford it because they make 17000 now has to make 23000 to afford it. That's why they didn't add you know, the siding. It's, a, it's just a cost thing. So if there was a, a larger property like the ones in Ferndale or something like that? What I was trying to avoid is I went on eBay. You can buy a container house and have it shipped to your location in 10 days 
for 13,900. Now that doesn't meet the requirements even of 600 square feet. That is my concern. I don't want that. If you go and look at the houses online, if you go look Google some of these houses, they're beautiful. That's where we need to open up. That's where we need to go. We don't want to go here. And I, that's what everybody here is defending against. We don't want to see this, and I, I'm with you. But talking about bricks and cinder blocks around a container house, that's not, it's just not the spirit. At one time, not too long ago, vinyl privacy fences were not permitted in this community. Your fence had to be metal, in other words, chain link, or wood. Now vinyl's permitted. I think it's actually preferred over wood because of the maintenance issue. So, we don't know what the building materials of the future are going to be. Thinking of the house George Jetson lived in. <laughs> and I thought I'd have a flying car by now, too, but never mind that. Um, things are changing. And the question is, how do, I think, how are we going to adapt to that? I would love to see 2,400 square foot houses in this city. And the only way that's going to be practical is we're going to have to change our densities. Because on 40, 50, and 60 foot lots, you're not going to build a house that size. Expecting the houses to look like every house on either side of it, I don't think is realistic either. Because of the new houses that I've seen built on East Point, they don't look anything like the mid-century ranches and bungalows. And some might say they don't even fit the neighborhood. I think what the intent of the ordinance was is if you have an all-brick neighborhood, you don't want somebody coming up and putting up a vinyl house in the middle of it. Again, minimum standards and above. So are we saying we don't want any houses anywhere for any reason that are smaller than 880 square feet? Are we saying we don't want to look at alternate materials for the exterior? Or do we want to take a metered approach to this with something like a planned unit development where we evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis? What are your thoughts on it? The two locations that were those, were these container houses would have been located or about as ideal as it gets that's that said i don't still want a 400 square yourself. foot container house there uh, i don't I, I don't think it's fair to the neighbors who bought the houses next to them and i, I don't know the outcome but it, it does create um, a lot of unknowns so it, we're a family town. You, you can't raise a family. I guess you can raise a family in a 400-square-foot 400, 400 house. I, I don't know. Can I make one comment about the two houses? So the two houses were eyesores for years that were next to these people. One burn, burned but didn't burn completely down, and it took years we had it as a show cause hearing mm -hmm. eventually i think in motion to demo it finally they kept telling us they were going to do something about it and then the other one was that the one that burned the day after you guys ordered no, it demoed it's actually a different one they both burned the other one that mr lubeck's talking about was the one you probably saw in the news where they had a meth lab and it burned the day after we had a show cause hearing about it 
which I'm like, okay, arson immediately, right? You know, I'm sure that's what everybody was thinking that was part of that, but... It wasn't the Harley in the living room? <laughs> that house, and that house looked terrible. Like, that, that was one of the worst houses I've seen, and that was like that for years, too. So, I mean, empty lots look better, for sure, now with both of those houses. I mean, I don't know how, you know, I just... So we're talking about how the houses look. Uh, I just wanted to throw that in. <laughs> you know, even our 40-foot lots, you could take two container, two containers and put them together, and you'd still have a lot of room. And I'd rather see that. You take two 600-square-foot container houses, put them together, you got 12. <coughs> and you could do a lot with that. And, like, again, it would fit on our lots. That's like four containers. Hmm? That's four containers. Two, uh, 40, by, 40 by 8 by yeah, 8 yeah. is 320 well, square feet. So weren't like they talking about a 60-foot container at one time? One small and a one larger one. 140, 120. That's what, they have. That's what the presentation is. Okay, I thought they were talking about a 60-foot container. They don't make 60-foot containers as far as I know. 40 feet long, 20 feet long. I think there are variants. I've seen variants too, but I think 20 and 40 are the standards. I haven't seen a 50. I'm the last <coughs> Mr. DeHunt, Ms. Ulinski, any comments? I have no problem with moving forward and yeah, the future is changing. That's what what happens. Um Again, though, I don't want to lower the standards of, of our minimums. And what will it do for the housing? I mean, how do you do comps for, for the neighbors? How does all that affect the neighbors? But I, I, I mean, if we do the PD, does that mean that these container homes that are this project just go right in below our minimum? Well, the, the proposal on the planned unit development would be to allow the smaller square footages. Not just of container homes, but of any residential dwelling. If somebody wanted to come to us with strange to go from a Jetson's house to a geodesic dome that was less than 880 square feet, It could be permitted. If somebody wanted to build a conventional house of 600 square feet under a PUD type thing, we could allow them to build that. Just saying that if you want to build a normal house, you just want to build a house in East Point, it's got to be a minimum of 880 square feet. If you want to build smaller than that, come see us and jump through our hoops. Every planning seminar I've been to, they've made the same point. Write your standards to what you really want to encourage, because that makes it easy. And most of the time, the developers want to take the fast and easy way through it, other than going through the long, drawn-out method of getting special permissions for everything. The, the other thing right now, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. If I thought you are done. If in the future things change and 600-square-foot houses become a standard, not just not in East Point, but if it's the trend heads that way, then maybe there will be more appetite to change it. Right now, we're in the low end of Macomb County as far as square footage for houses. And now we're going to go lower? You know, that's where I just, mm -hmm. I, have a, I struggle with that. Agreed. So. Ms. Van Heron, let me propose a hypothetical to you. While I'm sitting here debating this tonight, my 700 square foot house is 52% destroyed by a fire. Can I rebuild it? No. Why not? Doesn't meet the ordinance requirements. 
So I would have to increase the size of that house in order to rebuild. I'd have to rebuild what was there, plus put an addition on it to get it up to the 880 square feet. You'd have to meet today's ordinance standards, which, as you know, is a minimum of 880 square feet. Located on the lot. And the but this was the cutest little cottage house in the neighborhood that everybody loved. It's damaged 50% or more beyond its value, excluding the foundation. It cannot be rebuilt unless it complies with the ordinance requirements. But I don't know what that's got to do with any of this. We've got to move this along. No, I'm just, just, I'm just <laughs> saying that, you know. It's getting late. <laughs> but under a PUD, I could be allowed to rebuild that house. That's right. I, I'm just making a, a point to the commissioners that. Yes. Yes. But then I think this council or this commission would have to look reasonably at, at that applicant who came before you to build a 500 square foot container home and you couldn't just say no that's ridiculous we don't want anything that small because then what's the point of even doing it if if nobody stands a chance well, why change the ordinance then then you're just leave, giving them false hope is this the tipping point to tiny homes i don't know <laughs> i'm just curious yeah i don't know because that was thrown at us last year we were we somebody wanted i can't remember who it was wanted us to look into tiny homes and I, I'm just wondering if this is the tipping point towards tiny homes and we're just using this Tony project to, I, d I don't know. I, I, it could be, maybe if you want it to be. <laughs> That's a whole new ball of wax because I've got information on tiny homes too. And tiny homes are often not only, as Laura was just saying, uh, more like 300 square feet, they're also often on chassis and movable, and, you know, they drive around the country and put them in different spots. And Containers have chassis, too. They have wheels. What has? Containers can have wheels, too. Okay, well. I mean, Mr. Broll has a, uh, an eBay thing that you can just roll the house right up there and off the chassis or off the wheels, and there you go. But in looking Mobile at homes. the presentation that was made tonight... Those containers were probably less than 50% of the entire dwelling. No, they no. weren't. No. There was the common area. Yeah, they were actually something like 75% in that one case, and in the other case, they were 100% of the dwelling. That second concept had two containers and no conventional framing. The first concept had two. One was a... Um, a, a, the 80 foot one was a 20 foot or the 60 foot or whatever it was and, and some conventional framing like 25 30 percent of it was conventional framing what they called the breezeway yeah but it, but it was it was going to be all insulated it was part of the living space yeah. it's getting late isn't it yeah. getting late well, were we were we okay. supposed to move on this like at warp speed? Because for whatever reason, I feel like the last meeting we were told that there was a time frame that we had to make a decision and be jolly on the spot. Ideally, we would have liked a decision or recommendation to city council to come from tonight's meeting. They do intend to move quickly with the project, and, and th that's their, their hope and intention. Um, but I'd like to say to the people out here, go to city yeah. council and voice your opinion. And before you sit down, tell them, I vote. Because that's the only recourse you have. Okay, somebody make a motion on this. We've already, we've already clearly decided we're not going to lower the standards. So the next question is, do we want, want to recommend a change that would allow us some flexibility for alternate materials and lesser sizes 
in terms of a planned unit development? Mr. Lavand, how is it that we phrased it with the chickens? We decided we did not want to touch the ordinance and we referred it back to city council. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we do not change this ordinance and that we refer it back to city council for their decision. Support. Okay, we have a motion and a support to do that. If more, more specificity on the actual, not, not change the ordinance in what way, uh, Mr. Don? That we do not lower the standards of our ordinance, that we do not lower we, we've, we already did that last month. We're not talking about lowering standards. We're talking about doing this in terms of a, I believe Ms. Hall recommended a PUD would be the most applicable method here. It would allow the, the most review by the Planning Commission and the City Council. Okay. I would think a motion maybe in support or against probably then what is written by Ms. Haw probably makes sense, I think. Well, what could happen is this proposed motion here where it says motion by, supported by, to recommend to City Council. It simply could be motion by, supported by, to not recommend to City Council. Or you could recommend it and vote no on it. There should be a recommendation either for or against. All right. I'd like to make a motion to not to recommend to City Council the ordinance changes that would require a special land use or PUD approval to allow for unique home sizes and construction materials as follows. Section 50-70B regulations to include the language a special land use or PUD approval can be sought for houses that do not meet the minimum square footage. Section 50-151A and 12 include the language a special land use approval or PUD approval can be sought for houses that do not meet the minimum square footage. Storage area can be contained in an accessory structure and 50-169-2A include the language exception those homes that have a special land use in PUD in parentheses approval. Is that what you wanted? Mm. Yes, that, well, that's what I was talking I'll about. I'll support that. <coughs> Motion in support. Motion was by Mr. DeHaan, supported by Mr. Lalonde. We're kicking it back to City Council. Uh, can, before we take a vote on this, can I understand something? The motion that was just made only spoke to square footage. It did not speak to exterior building or wall materials. Is there another motion that's going to come down for that? No, so it was it was within those three sections of the ordinance that I specified. Um, it, when you look at the actual text changes on the following pages, it allowed a special land use to be um, granted for the the size requirements or the building materials. The end of the second line. Include language special land use. Under 50 169. 169, okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't, yeah. Yeah. It does okay. mention construction materials in that second line, but. Of the motion? As, yeah, maybe I, maybe I missed it I in don't the see motion. it in the motion. Um, construction, at the end of the second, second line, right? Construction materials as follows. <coughs> I guess it doesn't explicitly then say it later, but I th I'll take it as both. If, uh, if I mean, I'm okay with that if that's if if that's acceptable, that's fine. Is, I don't know, Mr. Albright, I guess. <laughs> well, the public hearing was held this evening for changes to three different sections in the uh, zoning ordinance, 
and those three different sections are provided for in the motion that was made to not recommend uh, changes to those three sections. So the, the proposed ordinance as read uh, does cover the, the sections that were um, advertised for public hearing this evening. And I think this doesn't help my case, but um, I think a few people that walked out thought the Planning Commission was recommending. They are not. Then that not re not recommending it goes to City Council, and we see Planning Commission does not want to do this, <coughs> but then City Council can decide to still go forward if they'd like or not. Like the, that That's how the process works, if that makes sense. Well, they're they're not recommending that we do that. Yeah. <laughs> and and if I say, might say, Mr. Broll, that it's that last sentence in there where it says ex, um, section 50-169-2A include the language exception those homes that have a special land use or PUD approval. So it would be an exception to the requirements that you match the design of the homes in the area, and the the exception to be to that. Um, requirement would be when you grant a special land use approval. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I guess I should have said if this motion goes through, they ha or they haven't voted yet, so I guess yeah. <laughs> I was making an assumption also there, I guess. Is there any other discussion on this? Yeah, I, I will just say that I won't, I'm not in favor of this vote because I am in favor of flexibility in building materials. I do agree with the square footage, but I'm going to vote against it because I don't agree with the, with the alternate materials. I think we need flexibility. We're hemming ourselves in a little bit. I will also be voting against that. This, in addition to the material, the square footage, I think we need to have more flexibility if we want to look at being innovative in this community. Any other comments? So maybe you want to recommend to approve the motion <laughs> instead of denying it then. Because it gives you that flexibility. Secretary, call the roll. Mr. DeHunt? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Mr. Broll? No. Sheila Ulinski? No. Chairman Lubeck? No. That's a, it's a tie then, doesn't go through. It passed. Okay. I'm guessing the opposite would go through either. Yes, we move on to the hearing of the, no. Unless somebody else wants to make a motion. Because there should be some recommendation that goes through, right? Yes, there, should. there should be a motion one way or another to the city council so the proceedings can continue. It's going to be hard to do with the six of us. Table the matter to the next meeting when we have a full motion. If somebody wanted to make a motion the other way, we could call another vote on it. If we are a deadlock, then we're going to have to table it until the next meeting when we have a deciding vote here. The thing about a PUD is it provides flexibility. It doesn't automatically allow for a project to go through. It has to go through the Planning Commission and then it would go through City Council. So you have two layers of bodies that would have to review that. Um, and I, I'm all for flexibility. What if I was paying attention? I believe if we change this motion to allow it, that it would f actually have a failing vote. Like because you're in on one and you're out on the other, yeah, I don't see Mr. I Broll. Don't, I don't, yeah, the square footage, I don't want to go smaller at this time. Um, but I do think flexibility of materials would be 
is important. Mr. Chairman, I make, okay. I'm sorry, I was going to make a motion. No, go ahead. That we, ta we table this to the next meeting. I'll support that motion. Secretary, please call the roll. So, there, so just so there's a full commission of all members. Yes. Yes, we've uh, deadlocked on this. Or an odd number, at least. And uh, to break the tie, we are going to need our seventh member, so. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Chairman Lubeck? Yes. Mr. DeHunt? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Mr. Broll? Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Just out of curiosity, what is this time frame that the Ford people have for us? I don't think they've given us an exact time frame. I think they'd like to move quickly. Then why did it seem like the last meeting that we were all fired in a rush to got to do this, got to do that, it's got to be done real quick, because that's the impression that was given last time. And I actually, I believe I was at a city council meeting, and it was kind of the same thing. We got this exciting new thing with the Ford Foundation, and everything's got to move real quickly. Well, we'd like it to move quickly. But there's no, it's got to, everything's got to be buttoned down by April 1st type thing. I'm not sure of what the specific dates are. Um, I think they would have liked ability because they're not going to continue and, and finalize the engineering and, and meet the people who are potentially purchasing these homes that will affect the designs of the homes and and have some input in them and and do they're not going to proceed to that part until they get approval or know that it will be an approved project um i think they you know ideally would like to be able to pro start moving on it now so they can you know have it put up in the spring i hope those containers aren't coming from china Coronavirus. All right. <laughs> now we're going back to unfinished business. Item B, the medical marijuana draft ordinance. Where did we leave off last time? I think page 11. Page 11. It was page 11. They were discussing the factors, and I believe uh, the commission stopped at subsection 4, yes. A4, right around the middle of the page. I'm going to make a motion. Before you make a motion. Yes. I believe when we tabled this, we asked for some additional information. And... I was not provided with any additional information. What was the additional information? At this hour, off the top of my head, I don't remember what it was we had requested. I actually didn't refer to state law because some of the things that we were going through as far as the factors in granting a permit Weren't there some concerns about whether we had the right to ask certain things? And that those things already would have been cleared at the state level if they were coming to us pre-approved, which is what we are requiring? Yes. I think, that's, I think that was what it was. Commissioners, the meeting minutes from last month um, state that there was questions over um, deferring to state requirements regarding insurance and the city's legal liability if the city appoints a committee. I believe the finance director was going to be consulted. Has he been? I'm not sure. I wouldn't be involved in that. Was there any more to that? I'm going to make a motion if we're ready. Um, it's 11:10. Make a motion to table the medical marijuana draft ordinance until the next meeting. Second. 
We have motion and support. Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Broll? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. DeHunt? I said that I would discuss this matter. That was part of my agreement. That was part of my request of City Council was to find out when we had a new council seated if they wanted to continue. Uh, I feel in all honesty, I, I in, in my mind said that I would go ahead and discuss this. So even if it's only a page or two, I would discuss it tonight, even though I'm absolutely exhausted and we're all losing it up here, I still think part of me thinks that we need to at least discuss a little bit of it because we asked city council if they wanted it and they said yes. So I will vote no. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yes, Chairman Lubeck. Well, since Mr. DeHunt broke protocol and I let him, I'm going to pile on. I agree with you. However, I don't have the information I requested to proceed. Therefore, I am voting to table. So that's a yes vote. Which brings us now to the second hearing of the public. Mr. Chair, could I interrupt just for a moment, please? Would the ch commission consider spe scheduling a special meeting to continue the review of this um, ordinance rather than um, putting it off another month? Only if you bring water. <laughs> Open your fridge. <laughs> I can certainly ask the city to buy water. Thank you. Water and divine intervention would be nice, too. Uh, anybody object to special meeting to handle this? No. No. Okay. The next question becomes when? Do it two weeks from tonight. I can do next week. About on a Wednesday. February 27th? Uh, we're doing the land, well, just wouldn't be able to meet in here. We're doing the landscape awards for the beautification commission that night. Okay. But uh, could probably meet over there then. We did that, what, a month, two months ago. We were both here. We'll just swap you guys in there this t that time and <laughs> beautification commission. Is there anything wrong with a Tuesday? Other than we have city council meetings those nights, um, every other, but. Um, well, I was thinking the 25th because there would not be a council meeting that night. That would be a good night. Well, I can't do anything from the 18th to the 27th. Not <sighs> you do without me. <clears throat> of course, we don't know the availability of. Mr. Palazzola. About next week? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, next Good. week. Next week. 13th, Thursday? Sure. Sure. Works. Is there any conflict with? Not that I see. Using this room? I don't believe so. Can we make it earlier than seven? We could. If, if we could get commissioners here, we could certainly do it earlier. That's pushing it. When's the school board meet? Monday? I don't know. Yeah, second and fourth Mondays. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're doing a Thursday. Thursday, February 13th? Yes. What's the earliest everybody could be here for a meeting? I'm flexible. Six. <laughs> I don't think six is going to be compatible with. 
Mr. Palazzola, but at 6.30 might. 6.30? Yeah. And can you let me know what that information is that you needed, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'll find a way to uh, find, get, get, get the information to you. Actually, Ms. Ha had that. In the, it was contained that she read from the minutes? the minutes? Okay. I'll track that down. I am sure we would have tackled some of this tonight if not for the subject matter and length and number of agenda items tonight. Mr. Chairman, was there a motion scheduling the special meeting? No. Not yet. Who will make that motion? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we schedule a special meeting for Thursday, February 13th at 6.30 in the to evening. To discuss. To discuss the marijuana ordinance. Maybe we'll get through the whole thing and be done with it. You just cursed us. <laughs> Hope springs eternal. Do we have support? Did. Pardon? Okay. Motion by Mr. DeHaan, supported by Mr. Jakubiak. Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. DeHaan? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Brohl? Yes. Ms. Ulinski, yes. Chairman Lubeck? Yes. That brings us to the second hearing of the public. Any of those left wishing to speak may do so at this time. Same rules as before, you have three minutes. State your name. If you've already printed it on the paper, you don't have to print it again. Gary Myron, East Point resident. Um, on the notification of the lot on Nels and Hayes, about the container houses, I live seven houses away. Anytime I go in the front, look south, I can see <coughs> that property. And just wondering why I was not notified that this was going on. And a lot of my other neighbors were not notified. We should have been, I think. We were notified when Oakwood was doing both of their projects. We we're right around the corner. I don't know if it should be like a 16th or 1 8th radius mile that everybody in that area would get notified. I know some people on um, Furwood got notified. I talked to them. I'm not sure if anybody else got notified, but I don't know if the other side of Hayes got notified. But I think, you know, anybody with, you know, could see it anytime I'm in the front looking south, I could see that property. Um, and just check to get the agenda on the website that has been on there since October. Thank you. Bye. <coughs> Anyone else wishing to be heard? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Harvey Creek's resident. A lot of things were passed over the board tonight and a lot of things, but what was actually brought forth is a lot of questions still need to be answered. I come down here and half of the stuff I didn't understand. I mean, I apologize, I haven't been here for a while, but yet what you're going through right here is you really didn't come up with the answers. If the question I'd ask, and I really, really appreciate this too, if I buy the lot next to me, I can get two containers, depending on, is there a minimum now and a maximum of these containers? Is there a minimum square feet? Uh, are you saying that if you get, is it 400 to 640 square feet now? What kind of standards are you putting on this now? If, if, if I don't want to buy one of these houses, if I buy a lot, what kind of standards are going to be put on what I can build on it? If I want to use containers. And then material too. I, I really appreciated that. What kind of materials are you going to have we can use on these? And are, are we going to go ahead and say they have to be X amount of, of footage off the ground? And, and that's my biggest, one of my other biggest concerns too, especially was with the roof. 
It doesn't have to have a pitch on it? Does it or doesn't it? I mean, I can see some head shaking up there. I think we, but they're saying now that they, you know, they, they've either got these houses in progress that we can go see, and what I'm going to, as soon as I, I'm going to get those addresses too, and go take a look at them and actually see how they drain as per rain and how they do as per snow. <clears throat> There's still, to me, there's still so many questions to ask. I am really glad to see this commission because you're, you're doing your due diligence and you're really doing your homework. As I said, the thing that I don't understand is the power sometimes of the city council itself per se because how are these questions getting asked through the residents to this commission and I see Cardi is here right now. I would love to go to one of these meetings, closed doors, and see what actually is brought up in, in front of them to see where this power lays and how it goes. Because more or less, I've heard all these people say, I didn't read the paper. They say it was embarrassing. It was already a done deal. Maybe I'll go back and I'll get the paper now, and maybe I'll read it. But I try to stay up with the city too. I took a little bit of a vacation and took some time off. Maybe I shouldn't have because I lost a little bit of the language but this this commission 30 seconds mr Creek. thank you i say this uh this commission is doing this due diligence and i really appreciate that and i really like what you've got to say and stay right with them and please don't let those homes come here because if one has to go to a veteran leaving another one and then how many more can they build thank you Well, you won't be more than three minutes. Okay. Um, my, my thought is, again, um, about the finances, okay? This is all being funded. The building of these structures is being funded by Fords. And then they're going to give them to these low-income people? Is, is that the plan? Or they're supposed to buy it? If they're such a low-income family, how are they going to afford to buy it? Even 50000 or $75,000. If they're only making twelve dollars an hour, yeah, and, and if they're the younger people that are just beginning, they don't have any credit, or many low-income people. I don't want to categorize, but their credit is bad. How are they going to get a mortgage? And then you, uh, mortgage people are not mortgage companies are not going to finance these. Um, should I say absolute not? I don't know, but I don't believe that they are. Like I said, I'm a realtor. Um, I myself have tried to get financing for lower cost houses and, and couldn't do it. They don't want to give it. You know, when the, mortgage, when the uh, market crashed, you couldn't get a mortgage for a $20,000 house or, or 30 or 40. They didn't want to give it unless you had huge credit. Uh, well, they still wouldn't give it. They don't want to do those low mortgages. So it, how is it going to benefit anybody financially uh, because they are so non-conforming it's going to be hard to uh, value the houses around it it's going to bring it down <coughs> um, if you go to Zillow and and you want to find the market value of your home what do they do a market they, it's a blanket market they choose they choose a neighborhood they don't Compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges, they just blanket it. So if you got this $50,000 house and a $500,000 house, the average is gonna be much lower. That $500,000 house is gonna lose its value. And that's what's gonna to happen to us. Uh, I moved into this neighborhood right on Hayes down the street from one of your lots, uh, pr proposed lots. This is, this is my retirement stepping stone. Um, and if it loses value, it's gonna hurt me a lot. So I'm definitely against it. What was your name again? Sorry. Judy Trupiano. Okay. I, I was I trying to look through my list and. I scribbled. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's all about money, right? Anyone else wish to be heard? Seeing none, we will close the second hearing of the public. We will move on to commissioner's comments. Start this evening with Ms. Ulinsky. I have nothing. Mr. DeHunt. 
There is an ugliness permeating the city in some areas. There's people feeling like their voices aren't being heard. There are huge swaths of, of people within our community that feel like they've, they've, they can't speak up. What I saw here tonight from the residents is heartening to me that people have the guts to step up. Um, times change, community changes, demographics change, everything changes. But I was, I was heartened by the one thing that the resident said about neighbors. Neighbors not being classified by race, sexuality, age bracket, things like that. That's wonderful. I came home today and somebody had shoveled my snow. That's community. I get very tired of hearing people being blasted in our community for opposing whatever viewpoint. So I guess in this spirit, go out and say nice things about our city because there's a lot of good people in this city. We all might not agree with one another. I don't agree with everybody up here. But you know what? We're passionate. We're not here. We're not getting paid. We're not here for our health. We're not here to get rest. Do something for your city. Be passionate about your city. You can respect people you don't agree with. So go out and say nice things, please, to everybody. Mr. Brawl? Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank Mary for the... Um, the, the motions that you write on the the wall um, <laughs> issues those motions are nice it's nice it's helpful so I just want to recognize you for that um, spirited day today uh, I think there's an opportunity for these houses in our community um, I'd encourage everybody that's sitting up here to to look a little bit deeper and do a little more research on what's out there because there's some really nice houses um, we have an issue about the square footage. I get it. I'm on. I'm. I'm on that page right now. I recognize that in the future, maybe things will change. Right now, I'm not on that page to reduce our square footage. But the container house itself, there's some really nice container houses. So I would just encourage you to to look a little bit into that. Thank you, Mr. Jakubiak. Yeah. The only thing I want to say is I don't think we know everything there is to know, and. Um, because we don't, and because this is being rushed, I got a bad feeling, so that's why I'm saying no. No, 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 no. Mr. Lalonde? I have nothing. Mr. Albright? No comment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Haw? No comment. Thank you. The gentleman sitting next to you whose name at this hour escapes me. I don't have anything either. Chris Madigan. I apologize, Mr. Madigan. No problem. Ms. Van Heron? Yes, Mr. Chair. I'll just um, mention that public notification was put in the newspaper regarding the ordinance, um, uh, possible ordinance changes, and that's what's required by um, the Zoning Enabling Act that we put a notice in the newspaper we took an extra step to notify everyone within 300 feet of the two subject properties even though we weren't taking action on those properties um, per se tonight and and so we did do a 300 foot mailing around those properties for um, the residents to be aware of of this evening's meeting um, that's all I have tonight thank you Thank you. I was going to mention if there was a mailing to individual properties, it was probably within a 300-foot radius. Yes. Any comments, Mr. DeMonico? Uh, just a couple quick ones. I'll make it quick just to, yeah, to respond to a couple quick things. Um, Mr. Creech, yeah, it was pro we can't control the Macomb Daily articles that said it was a done deal. They shouldn't have said that. We probably should 
maybe try to get them to correct that because this is obviously there's a lot left to the process and I know other people had mentioned that too I'm sure people saw on Facebook um, and then um, Mr. Myron I think we are missing a couple agendas but we do have January and February up maybe they weren't maybe someone snuck them on after he <laughs> said I don't know but we do need to improve there for sure about the agendas and um, the city's website and then um, were we able to expand it all on how the financial like what what is Ford what I know I guess is just that they are going to have um, a mortgage I don't know what like Ford fund covers or how exactly that works yeah the discussion at the at the initial meeting with them was that they're going to um, deal with qualified people who could qualify for a mortgage so they would have to have a certain credit score that Habitat works with them routinely to make sure that these folks have a, a certain credit score and they're trying to keep their monthly payment down to three hundred and ninety five dollars um, they and, and I brought up initially talking to them about the potentially difficulty they might have in getting mortgages on a unique property like this and and Ford said that that they would certainly look into that further and and if they had to provide the mortgages themselves they would that doesn't really respond to down the road when it sells and somebody tries to get a new mortgage that I could see that there could be potential difficulties in that um, but but they they were not going to be paying for these houses for the folks they were just um, you know handling the the um, startup costs Okay. And um, well, actually, I'd like to say, Mr. DeHaan, I appreciate. I, I like your comments uh, tonight about uh, everyone saying nice things about the city. I, um, I, I would like to see that also. And um, I think that was mainly it. I think I said most of the things earlier about. Oh, we're getting kicked out here. This is uh, only the second time this uh, this happened on December for City Council. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I pretty much said most of the stuff about these uh, homes earlier, but i um, glad I think we have, you guys talked about a lot of different things here, so that was nice to see, and I guess we'll, uh, we'll see how this goes. Thanks, Mr. Lubeck. Okay, I'll see how much longer the lights are going to stay on because I have a lot of comments tonight. <laughs> First, uh, received a Planning Commission roster. Double, triple, quadruple check it. Make sure your phone numbers and emails are correct. Mr. DeHant is indicating he has a problem with his on there. Your, his email is in yes. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I know there's been a problem with those. Uh, for whatever reason, my phone number was on there incorrectly. It's now correct, so I'm happy with that. Uh, this whole thing with the container houses came to us. With bad information. Okay. Apologize, not bad. Incorrect information. And seemed to change almost to be unrecognizable from the beginning. What was brought to us was two 600 square foot facilities that were going to be for veterans. Tuesday night, it's a 600 and a 400, and there's no guarantee it's going to be veterans. Uh, talking about mortgages, I briefly asked about that, and I was told they actually do have a bank that is willing to provide mortgages for it, for these new constructions. This whole container thing is new. We don't know what the future is going to hold. I imagine probably somewhere down the line, somewhere we'll still be willing to give them a mortgage. Uh, it's called innovation. Welcome back, Mr. DeMonico. Thanks, Mr. Lubeck. We missed you. Yeah, I was in the hospital, I think, while you were having your last meeting. <laughs> uh, when was it? Beginning of January? I. Yep, yeah, Harvey uh, came in and dropped the bomb on us. Oh, yeah, I, wa I, I watched it live stream from the hospital, yeah. <laughs> and they let you out? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
want to thank Ms. Van Heer and Ms. Ha, the gentleman whose name I forgot again, <laughs> Mr. Madigan, and Mr. Albright for your perseverance and patience with us tonight. Uh, I hope we don't see too many more agendas like this. It was a lot packed into it. Oh, one other comment on the container houses. Yeah, it seemed like they wanted an answer immediately. I don't know how this all came about, but it caught the Planning Commission off guard. Uh, what was printed in the papers is unfortunate. Uh, Macomb Daily has a reputation for having some reporters who uh, never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. So uh, it's not the first time we've had something put in front of us and we've been expected to act really fast on it. And I hope administration and city council understands that the way this commission works is we are going to proceed deliberately and with the information we need. So don't try to fast track something on us. Because the faster you try to push us, the more it seems to slow us down. With that said, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn this meeting now. Support. I don't know who you want to put down for support, but just call the roll. Mr. DeHunt? Yes. Ms. Ulinski? Yes. Mr. Jakubiak? Yes. Mr. Lalonde? Yes. Mr. Broll? Yes. Chairman Lubeck? Yes. Thanks for the nice words. Appreciate it. You guys got your job. We're trying. Just for the